Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is March 22nd. It's Wednesday and we are joining in to the Gwyneth Paltrow ski crash trial live coverage. Right now they are putting a few things on the record about the first witness that's going to testify today and what that witness can testify about. For those of you new to this case, let me give you a brief road so far. Opening statements were yesterday. This is a civil case for negligence. The plaintiff is Terry Sanderson. The defendant is Gwyneth Paltrow. Gwyneth Paltrow has counterclaimed, also sued the plaintiff. So she is the cross plaintiff. They are both suing for negligence. Negligence mean that there was a duty. There was a breach of the duty and that caused the damage to the individual. The duty here is your duty of care on a ski slope. That's why we're going to hear about the rules of the slope. Think of this case like a car crash. Yes, it happened on a ski slope, but what they are trying to determine is who is at fault for causing this crash. And the skier that is further down the ski slope has the right of way. Also to keep in mind, as we give a quick overview in Utah, it is a comparative negligence state. We will talk about that, but someone cannot recover if they are 50% at fault. So if they're both at fault, no one recovers. Does that make sense? If you're both at fault, no one recovers. If you're 49% at fault or less, you can recover damages. So they are trying to figure out who was at fault for this crash. A doctor is going to be testifying this morning. These lawyers have already been snappy AF with each other. We saw wild stuff in the opening statement. Gwyneth Paltrow's lawyer is becoming, uh, he comes off a bit condescending to me. And when you're Gwyneth Paltrow's lawyer, you need to be endearing. And that is not what we are seeing this morning. So we're going to take a look at these arguments in court real quick. What I think I'm going to do is back back the court up and start them at like 1.5 speed since all these lawyers talk slower than any lawyer I know. And we'll join court and catch up to the live feed that way. Law nerds, it's so good to see you. I didn't think we were covering this trial and then the lawyers wilded it out yesterday and now we're here for the morning session of court today. I have a few interviews that I cannot reschedule afterwards. Let's ride, let's just go. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not Let's get into it. I was busy making sure that my um, my screen was shared and I completely forgot to actually pull it up. So let's get some volume in this court. And is that, uh, this is the issue he clearly acknowledges in his deposition that he did not that they're putting on the record this the morning. MRI images I'm going to work on sound real quick. Hold so on. We want to make sure he does not. Uh, he's, he, if he's reviewed them since his deposition, that he's not allowed to speak to any opinions that derive from him having now reviewed the 2009. Here is the images. issue. Um, there is a doctor testifying. That doctor didn't review prior records. And so they don't want the doctor to be able to now testify about the prior records because he was not deposed on it. They're limiting or seeking to limit his testimony. Uh, it's speculative. And so we would ask that he. I don't yet remember all the lawyers' and, names. Of his of the post concussive symptoms that Mr. Sanderson. So this alleges. is Paltrow day two. His opinion was that um, the post concussive symptoms that the plaintiff is alleging um, or experiencing. He wasn't he wasn't denying that or the uh, Gibby was not denying that he was experiencing post concussive uh, symptoms. Just that the cause of or the origin of those symptoms he said was too speculative. Yeah, he has a, a theory about how uh, the ventricles in his brain uh, are a, a part of. of uh, how that might be occurring. But so this says, doctor is that saying that they can't um, the talk about the post-concussive um, symptoms. Persisting symptoms. I think the judge is probably going to let it happen. He'd be prohibited from offering that opinion. So, and then, and then the we'll last see. Uh, point we wanted to raise is that Dr. Gibby also has some oh, I think everybody's already <laughs> about fMRI scans that he did and given the court's ruling named on Dr. this lawyer, Fong, but we'll see what um, we do. The fact that Dr. Gibby acknowledges that his data set and Dr. Fong that at one point were similar that um, he that the court uh, apply the same sort of um, analysis to Dr. Gibby's 
fMRI opinions and exclude those as well. It, I mean, maybe it's appropriate to have him offer testimony outside of the presence of the jury to give foundation. He does say that he's moved on and improved the data set, and it's possible that it um, is not subject to the same critique that you offered yesterday for Dr. Fong's that supported your ruling to exclude her fMRI opinions. Interesting. So Dr. Fong that. got excluded. We'll talk about that more later. Is he using the uh, fMRI to support uh, a diagnosis or something? He's, he's not. He's, he, he is frank that the abnormalities that are shown in the fMRI can't be, um, uh, on the imaging alone, traced back to the ski accident or even just a concussion. But he says, given the fMRI and given the other evidence, that he thinks the fMRI abnormalities are connected to the concussion or the ski accident concussion. And how is he determining abnormalities uh, on the fMRI? Uh, by reference to a, a kind of normal database okay. similar to Dr. His own? Yes, his own. Okay, correct. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank I you. like this judge quite a lot. Mr. Bueller. So far. This is Mr. Bueller. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. This is the only defense um, attorney I remember. In summary, is Bueller. Counsel for the defendant is late and incorrect. They're late. They should have done this months ago. But on oh. the point, on the 2009. Snappy. FMI, late page, and incorrect. You're a day late and a dollar short, counsel. Dr. Gibby's deposition. Uh, line, well, the sound in this trial is going to kill uh, me. The defense is. Uh, Court reporter doesn't give us lines, but it's the second to the last line. Ooh. And in fact, if you go back Bueller. even further in the medical record, back to about uh, 2009, he clearly has imaging evidence of normal pressure and uh, hydrocephalus, MPH. And that's, we brought that up in opening. Uh, Dr. Gibby. So we are, uh, the, the jury is the not time. present Dr., yet? Uh, uh, Gibby mentioned this it again. I'll just go to the, page 39, he says. This is Dr. Outside Gibby. the presence of the that jury, doesn't mean he's arguing symptomatic over it. testimony. It doesn't mean a lot of people. In fact, there are people that are Rhodes Scholars that if you look back in some of the early literature on hydrocephalus, these fu people function at very high levels. So what did he review, a radiology report? Or did it's he the, the 2009 film film? radiology report that the Ooh. defense is relying on to say Yikes. Uh, Terry Sanderson. I'm had, talking about uh, your expert now. Is he, was he looking at uh, a radiology report or the film itself? I think both. Is he, is he going to be offering anything in addition to what you just read? Well, yeah, these lawyers get real snappy with just, each other. Bueller's real snappy. They did not. Uh, they, first, they bring it up late, and so it's hard for us to respond on literally no notice, um, the second day of trial. And clearly, they're incorrect that he discussed it in his deposition. They said, just said he didn't discuss it. So he, what you're reading from is a, is a discovery deposition? Correct. And, okay. and where he's disclosing his opinions, saying that the NPH doesn't mean he had all these problems. If he did, he wouldn't even be skiing. He couldn't even drive. He would be incontinent, couldn't control his uh, muscles, and he would have dementia. And that is not true. You know, he did not have any of those symptoms um, prior to the crash. Uh, after the crash, he doesn't have those because he, he, he's, uh, he's not symptomatic of MPH. He's symptomatic of a brain concussion. I'm more concerned with this disclosure of the 2009 MRI it's, that it formed a basis the, for his, his opinion. Yeah, he so. references it. That the was defense had it. What Dr. they were Gibby asking had about. it and was discussing it. Now, if the defense, the uh, third, um, and James, just remind me what your second point was. What? The condition of the ventricles opinion. Uh, what? What? Yeah. James. <laughs> Uh, the amount of audience participation in this case, yeah, they just are like, again, anyone know the answer to this? And, uh, it's, in, so, or it's so different. Best. It's so uh, wild. Dr. Wait, Dr. what are the stickers on that laptop? Discuss these things. Now, I'm not sure. I don't think the, the defense closed the loop on Dr. Gibby. If they don't ask him, is this all your opinions about NPH? What he is mentions that? NPH. Is this all your opinions about the condition of the ventricles? <sighs> I don't think they closed the loop on that. <laughs> Uh, finally, the fMRI. Oh, James, I uh, he discusses his, well, James, his, what was your uh, second point? Um, Counsel, you should have listened. The defense could have brought a motion on fMRI months ago, like they should have with Dr. Fong. But um, again, he uses the fMRI, and it's rock solid. He, Dr. Gibby happens PLH, to be one of the foremost right? experts on using the fMRI. He has Sarah, one of the, the foremost, Hufflepuff, is this uh, LA? No, this is in um, Utah. MRI machines. This is in, in Utah. Is, is it Alaska? Uh, oh, it might be Alaska. That that's that's, that's correct. It looks like Alaska, me uh, being... <laughs> Dumb. I don't know. That does look sure more like necessary. Alaska. Was, I was thinking he was trailing looking at islands. Terry Sanderson's x rays of his chest <laughs> and determining what he was doing, but it, he did not use the fMRI for diagnosis, which was, I think, the key point. And, uh, uh, no, you're on. Dr. Gibby is in the courtroom. Is, is everyone good with that? I'm fine with it. Why are you interrupting in the middle? Well, this is our Go game. ahead, Mr. Bueller. Oh, my God. You, Mr. Bueller, continue. The point is, not only is a very, very late, I mean, the second day of trial, but it's totally incorrect what they've said on all Very, very late. 
very very and, late. Uh, the two, uh, you know, I could read more about the um, uh, oh. what Doctor Bain says uh, because it's just inaccurate that he didn't discuss it in his deposition, and it's uh, inaccurate to say that they somehow that the defense can exclude this because he didn't discuss it in his deposition. Well, that's the, the argument. Loop, say, is this all of your opinions? Uh, I don't think they close that loop. Uh, if they don't ask him, if they go through his, uh, his background and his, some of his opinions, that doesn't mean he didn't have other opinions. And he can also rebut the defense's claims that NPH was the cause of Terry Sanderson's problems. Can you is, respond to the, to the argument that, con that he, did, uh, he did state a conclusion regarding the origin of the post-concussive symptoms, but he qualified it saying that it was speculative? I, I, I'd like to see the site because they've been inaccurate before. They've and, been uh, inaccurate before. It's hard for us before. to respond on no notice to something that I don't know what they're talking about. And uh, you, you know, know what they're this, talking about. He you just know, told this you. This is sandbagging at its best. Uh, and I don't mean to cast an aspersion, but it's this not, is. It's not unusual to have these these issues right, raised at right, trial. Right, just, you know, they've known about Gibby testifying for months, uh, actually years. He was properly disclosed two years ago, and they've waited until this moment. Uh, I think it's you know I I can I'm not going to guess why they're doing it at this last moment. But uh, uh, that's true on the fMRI. We just proved that they were incorrect on pages 38 and 39. And I believe it goes uh, to 40. Um, I think you've convinced me on that point. And the, uh, so on the point number two, I'd just like to have a citation. Where does he say this so we can respond to it? I can't find a speculative in the deposition. And then finally on fMRI, uh, they never tested him like uh, they tested Dr. Fong in her deposition um, eight days ago. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Eden, just briefly, I want to get the jury in here. Yeah, same. So they're saying it's so too late. You're on just first, uh, on it the looks point like the jury is coming in now, Dr. so Gibby I might zoom, the zoom, zoom. MRI images. On page, oh, no, the court's uh, still ruling. Let's see. On page. We're just a little bit behind. That's why we were moving at 1.25 speed. I have opinion, sped up his, uh, the audio because these lawyers talk slow. Of his and I wanted to catch this I have not been able to personally inspect images pre accident. No one has ever provided those to me. He says he's just seen the reports on the next page. And then on page 861, he says, I'm speculating honestly that perhaps the reason Neutron that he had book. persistence of this longer is that he has these underlying stiff ventricles, which didn't allow his brain to give way. Oh my God, we're going to be spending the, pressure, the morning you know, talking about stiff uh, ventricles, aren't water, we? Water, if you take a depth Damn chart it. and you put it into water, it sends it. I could go on, but that, that's the basic idea. And I'm saying 62. 61 Chrissy, into when 62. we have a pause, I'm going to talk about that. I'm simply hypothesizing that because of the increased amounts of CSF in here, that the brain is already stretched, and you slam into the snow and decelerate that, you produce an injury. And then, um, I, in terms of this question about whether we locked him in, I, I told him at the very start of the deposition, my purpose today is to be as efficient as I can in exhausting your testimony. I think that was clear. Um, so that's what I'll say. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Well, as to the, the MRI, I think uh, Dr. Gibby can certainly rely on the, on the radiology report. Um, it sounds like you didn't review the imaging, and I don't know that you were planning to have him offer any new opinions after having reviewed the imaging. But if there are any new opinions, those would uh, I would sustain an objection to those. There are no new opinions, but uh, to help explain Dr. San or Terry Sanderson's imaging, uh, the images can be looked at. Dr. Gibby has looked at them because he was provided them afterwards, if, if not before. He can't um, rely on that, though. And the deposition doesn't, you know, just because, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you all of your opinions eventually, but the deposition ends and they, they don't ask him all, his, all of his opinions. That doesn't mean it's not the duty of the witness. He's to, saying uh, that they, the that's on them. Failure to do that. And they didn't exclude it. So again, it. No, no new opinions related to the 2009 imaging. I mean, the images themselves, as opposed to the radiology report, which he said he relied on, but he hadn't seen the imaging. And so any, if he were to offer any new opinions, no uh, those would be not disclosed at this point on the imaging itself. Uh, he's not offering any new opinions. Okay. But, uh, okay. Report, because he does no. have those images now. And he references That's it. I mean, if it's report. pointed out on cross-examination that isn't it true <laughs> that you haven't, haven't evaluated these images, I mean, that may open the door. To something. Yes, it may. But as far as direct examination, he can't offer any new opinions on the 2009 imaging. Or say again, no new opinions. Or say that he has no new opinions. That, yeah, on direct, I think is important because otherwise they're, yeah. they're muddying the water. Right. I understand, and I appreciate all the counsel giving me their arguments, but I'd like to funnel it through <laughs> just one counsel on each side. Um, He's telling what an Paltrow's second attorney to shut up. <laughs> if, if there's an objection that an opinion is speculative, that'll be sustained. I mean, if, if it's not offered to a reasonable degree of medical probability, it's not proper. So any opinions need to have that as a foundation. And then finally, on the fMRI, if Dr. Gibby is going to rely on 
uh, a normative database, or I'm calling it that, I don't know what you might, or he might call it, but a database of functional MRI imaging so that he can compare the plaintiff's imaging to this I database. Think. I think, I, I, I believe you understand the requirements under Rule 702 to establish reliability first. And if you do that, it may come in, or it, it would, if, if he's able to the convince judge the court warns that there's them. sufficient reliability yeah, for, the those, judge for that, them. Uh, using that database, then that can come in. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm not going to tell you how to try your case, but that probably should happen outside of the hearing of the jury if you're planning on going in that direction. This is a uh, physically Honor, very small court. Your Honor, this came up, even though it's been known for years, what his deposition said. Um, and the, the shade. Uh, I would ask that we have a five-minute uh, time period to have a conference with Dr. Gibby. And then uh, outside of the presence of the jury, we readdress this issue because um, I know he's, I think he's probably he's his sitting there. He knows his testimony. His opinions haven't changed. He just, and uh, regarding um, speculation, well, there are risk factors for concussion. You can, uh, MPH, in, uh, I'm going to answer questions excess at fluid a, in those as we're caught up, makes you more susceptible to a concussion. So it's a risk factor. It's not speculation. It is just a risk factor. So, and the, the I mean, I think I gave my ruling, so if, if <laughs> you uh, did, if accurate, he shouldn't be offering yes. opinions that aren't supported by a reasonable degree of medical probability. Correct. And I understand your the nuance having to do with risk factors, and he may be able to offer that opinion. And there may be objections. So a reasonable degree of medical certainty. So. And there will be. We have a new problem, Your Honor. And, and just, just let me just finish or you know close the circle on this one. Yes, so we will. We can take a Fred. short recess. If you could let the jury know that we're working on some issues and it'll be a little bit longer. Okay. Um, and then if you if you decide after There's speaking with your expert that you will be, uh, I guess, tendering some of these issues or the issue regarding the fMRI database, then you can. Uh, then I'll certainly give you some time outside of the hearing of the jury to lay, try to lay a foundation for that. Okay, Mr. Owens. Your Honor, we have a new camera pointed directly Mr. at our Owens. client, right Ew. there on the right. Yes. I understand this from the AP. This is a. a Recess, I'll have the court representative, Tanya, take a look at how that camera's pointed and make sure that it's pointed at the lectern rather than at the council table. And Why is she so worried about it? it? Uh, Why is this instance, an issue? Reporters being in front of my client's car going out yesterday, uh, cameras in her face, like you, you inches away. Up during the recess with Tanya and talk to her about that. I've already talked to her about the fact that you've raised this issue yesterday, and, and, and I recognize it as a problem. I want to be advised if there are new changes. He's telling you to stop. It's just by chance that we see that there's a camera pointed directly at her, which is contrary to the decorum order. So I don't want changes. It's, that's not without by chance. Reporters telling you can you. see a camera. It is because of her I facial think that's expressions a yesterday. Request. So thank you. We'll take a short recess, and if you could let the bailiff know as soon as you're ready, Mr. Bueller. Yes, sir. Thank you. She's very annoyed, it seems, with the cameras. Let me make sure we get caught up to live without missing anything. Oh, we were only just a little bit behind. I'm going to answer all the questions that y'all have. Um, Gwyneth seems very annoyed by the cameras yesterday. She was walking out of court like this. So I'm not surprised to see her annoyed. All right. While we are on, um, Miguelino, can we put up a pinned comment just saying court is on recess waiting for the jury? So her facial expressions yesterday were of annoyance, I would say. So that's what's happening. She wants, doesn't want the cameras on her. It should be on the trial in the courtroom. There is a decorum order. I can pull that up later. I have it in my file, but I want to answer the questions that have come in so far. And then I will grab the decorum order. This attorney, and I didn't catch his name the time that the judge said it. This attorney said, the, um, Yesterday, he brought up the decorum order twice. He also said, per the decorum order, parties aren't allowed to leave until parties in the audience aren't allowed to leave till the jury's gone. So the exiting policy for the courtroom is the jury leaves, they wrap up their day, then the clients leave, then the audience is allowed to leave. He asked to um, shift that to allow Gwyneth to get out of the building early yesterday um, or right after the jury left yesterday. The plaintiff has been in and out of the courtroom, and we heard that yesterday from the attorney. They told the jury, "Fred, get off that camera." Oh, Fred, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scream and go at you, Fred. I will. Oh, he's not even afraid of it anymore. Fred, get off the cam. Fred, Fred is messing with this camera. He loves this camera. He is such a curious kitty. Thank you, Fred. So sorry, that's. 
I'm not having an earthquake. That's just my cat. Streaming with pets is always an adventure. So what was I talking about? Oh, the plaintiff, the counsel for plaintiff said yesterday to the jury during opening that the plaintiff may be in and out depending on the testimony about him, that it's painful for him to hear about all his cognitive decline and deficits, what have you. I don't know how the jury will read that, but he did explain it to the jury a little bit. So, um, Moon Magic Mayhem said, welcome fellow law nerds. Good morning. We ride. Can you explain why the plaintiff isn't there? Chrissy, we just talked about that a little. If I'm a juror, I think how serious is he if he can't. Fred is messing with my wires. Apolo apologies. So I'm going to have to, when court resumes, I'm going to have to get up for a second and move him off of my desk from back there. Um, Felix Funky Finds, I'm very interested in this trial. I was in an accident four years ago and got a concussion. I'm in my early 50s and still have symptoms. A concussion won't show up in imaging. Concussions are very serious and can be very difficult to recover from. I have tremendous amount of empathy. They can, it, TBIs and concussions can be absolutely life-changing. At the end of the day yesterday, the last witness was um, someone that Sanderson, the plaintiff, had been dating before this incident and then was no longer dating after the incident. Um, his personality changed a bit, and we know that this can happen with head injuries. His personality changed a bit, and their relationship deteriorated. Years later, he apologized for that. But it was interesting listening to her kind of break down the things that changed. And it, I'm, I'm, I have tremendous empathy for him. It, it, after this ski collision, whoever caused it, he was injured, and it changed his life. His life was less active. She said that his joy was gone. And that is something that is tremendously sad. It seems that his life has been very much altered by this. Now, whether he caused the collision or she did, I think the injuries, the extent of the injuries might be at controversy, but the fact of injuries is uncontroverted. So that's where we're at with this. The fact of injuries is, is a fact. How much injury is going to be a question. And then, there are those that are going to ask, well, how is he so injured and she's not? Is that age difference or is it because she hit him? The um, way that her attorney explained it in opening was that he was behind her, but they were going kind of slow and then they fell and then he kind of rolled to the side. But a slow speed crash where he kind of rolls to the side with his arm up against him, I don't know if that accounts for four broken ribs. We're just going to have to see. Um so I, I have a lot of empathy. CJ Cozy said, I think he sued for $3 million first trial. There was no first trial. This is the only trial in this case. This case was filed in 2019. Certain, um, certain things have changed. He was asking for punitive damages. The punitive damages got yeeted. So there are no punitive damages because the causes of action that would have punitive damages, the punishment ones, are gone. But he is asking for $3 million in compensatory damages. That's what they said in opening yesterday. This case has not settled. It's not resolved. There's no first trial, second trial. This is just um, this is just the trial. Um, Stina said Gwen, Gwyneth Paltrow has a resting bitch face. She always looks like that. She does, but she's going to have to deal with it. Uh, I think having an attorney, it might be me. Chat, let me know if you have a different opinion. I, I'm here for differences of opinion. It's why we why we chat. I'm here for differences of opinion. Um, I find the tenor of Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, lead counsel, the one with the gray hair who did opening, I will get their names down today, I promise. I find him to be a little condescending. And I think when your client is almost a untouchable type of celebrity, like a, a list celebrity. 
you need, especially when they are kind of known to be an untouchable Owens. Thank you, Chad. When you're known to be kind of an untouchable, aloof, almond mommy celebrity, you need a lawyer to humanize you to the jury. We saw this so well done with Johnny Depp's legal team. You know how much affinity I have for his legal team. I thought they were exceptional. We saw this with the way Johnny Depp's legal team handed or handled themselves. They were personable. I liked them. I listened to them. They did not come across as condescending. They came across as professional, but approachable. And they made Johnny Depp not an actor, but a human who had been through some horrible shit and had made some bad decisions and had been in a difficult relationship. They made him more human to the jury because of their nature. He has been very um, uh, condescending. It feels sometimes like he's talking down to the jury. You need to humanize your client, particularly when your client is Gwyneth Paltrow. There is a lot uh, you can see how the internet feels about Gwyneth Paltrow. She is she is a controversial celebrity in some ways. People find her very aloof, um, cold, and kind of untouchable. She, I mean, her website sells like $20,000 vagina eggs or whatever. Like, it's just not relatable at all. So you need a lawyer that brings the humanity to the trial and does it well, instead of being like a few less interruptions, please. I'm here for the snappy. I'm entertained. I'm exaggerating about the, the $20,000 eggs. I don't know how much they cost. I know they're expensive. The number was just a, a random grab. Um, you can go look at the website, but I warn you, there's a lot of adulty toys there. Um, it's, it's, it's amusing though. So anyway, it's 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 an interesting choice of lawyer, but then again, is this the lawyer that Gwyneth Paltrow relates to, right? You need to pick a legal team to to fill in your weaknesses as a client. And it's something that people don't strategize nearly enough. They want to pick a lawyer like them. You need to pick a lawyer opposite of you. If you are the client that's going to have to testify, I'm going to get to a few more questions. Here's something we need to remember for civil cases. There's 13,000 of you here. Um, first, go ahead and like and subscribe. Second, I'm on a new mission this trial because I wasn't going to cover it. And yesterday I was trying to do a live on other things and y'all were like, why aren't we covering it? I'm like, we're covering it now. So we have more live concurrent than any other network covering this trial right now. So my goal is to get us a bumpied up in live trending. That'll be great, but go ahead and subscribe. So something to be remembered because this is a civil case. The plaintiff can call Gwyneth Paltrow to the stand and do a direct examination of her. That did not happen in Depp v. Depp v. Heard because of stipulation. It did happen in Cardi B versus Tasha Kay. Because the first witness Cardi B called was Tasha K. It was like, fine, I'm suing you for defamation. Get up on the stand. We're going to ask you a bunch of questions. They can call Gwyneth Paltrow to the stand. Yesterday at the end of court, what I heard the lawyers say when they were going back and forth over scheduling, what the lawyers said, oh, why is this not caught up? Did I accidentally pause court? Okay. I think we're good now. All right, I'm going to turn this down a little so I don't jump out of my seat. Oh, they're still on break. How are we? Sorry, I had gotten behind a little bit. All right, I just want to make sure that we don't miss any moment of live court. So, Mingalina, if you'll keep an eye too, I appreciate it. I had, let me, all right, there we go. I just want to make sure we don't miss it when the judge comes back. So, they can call Gwyneth Paltrow. I'm seeing some reporting that that might happen today. I have a few interviews today, but I will keep an eye on that and see if she is going to testify today. Yesterday at the end of court, 
The lawyers were talking and said they intended to call her on Friday. They can call her at any time. So with that, they can call. Yeah, they can just call her at any time. All right. I'm going to go back to back to it. You said they better call Gwyneth Paltrow to the stand. This is different because they can call Gwyneth to the stand whenever they want, or they can wait for her to be called to the stand in her case in chief with her attorneys. But they're going to call her. I think they're probably ch trying to change the camera view. I think that's one of the things going on. But no, I, I double checked. We are caught up. They're still on break. So I'm looking at the website, $410 for a white tank top. This is the thing. This is the thing with Goop. It is not, there's nothing about Goop that's relatable, right? It is, it is, it is, it is on, it's just on another world, right? So we're just, the Gwenethness of it aside, I think this is a good trial to talk about trial strategy. The lawyers are snappy and we get to talk about liability and things that I haven't really thought about much since law school because I am not a catastrophic injury attorney like attorney Tom. I don't think about comparative negligence in my days. It's not a concept we need to deal with during criminal trials. It is something that we deal with during civil trials. The judge is back on the bench. Thank you. I will get to questions. Um, for the record, as we have I didn't do this earlier. This is Sanderson versus Paltrow, one nine zero five zero 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 four eight. You've made your record. Counsel are all present. Uh, Mr. Owens. Oh, he looked. The smile was Mr. Owens. Uh, the camera must. that I referenced uh, was a violation of the decorum order. Oh, That's the you. second violation in two days. Directly, <laughs> still photographer directly on my client's. They're case. allowed to already transmitted. Uh, nationally so I'm mad uh, he's mad as hell y'all the decorum the, the order we spent a lot of time on it's the court's order oh, he's People just are subject to, make to his criminal record. sanction and he's uh, asking for criminal sanction of the I, I want Associated to Press I don't want to have to be the one raising it I want them you to have comply. to be the one you're it's your job you're the Camera lawyer soon removed um, the as far as what's going on in the parking lot that's I'm not, I'm not going to conflate that with this photographer who's doing something differently. Um, the, 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 uh, what's going on in the parking lot is uh, uh, Tanya's has worked with your staff in determining how to handle the parking lot transitions. And I think that's been smoothed out. In terms of violation of the Freaking court's coughing. decorum order and, and have the camera pointing where it's not supposed to be pointing, I mean, essentially, cameras are supposed to follow the microphone. This is a, what's, what the court has permitted is media coverage of the proceeding, not of the individuals who aren't participating in the proceeding when they're not participating. So if you're speaking into a microphone, you can expect that an image may be captured. If you're not speaking into a microphone, you, shouldn't, you should not be expecting that an image would be captured. The coughing um, is going to get me. And I do, I do see this as a violation. And I've asked uh, that that the that the uh, reporter be told that it, uh, this is now interrupting our proceedings. It's now interfering with our proceedings, having to deal with these issues. And if it happens again, the offending reporter will be asked to leave. Great. And our, the still photographer is to stay in his seat when taking pictures. Is that right? Stay in his location. Unless we're all standing. Uh, then they can well, stand and take a picture. How about entering and exiting? Can they uh, be in the path of my client? No. Thank you. I have a new issue, which is this uh, beheading in front of me. May I? Sure. This, this was laid on our desk just now. Oh, We geez. did get a picture of it the day before Dr. Fong was deposed, which was... Eight days ago, we got a picture. Your Honor, they're, they're intending to have uh, Dr. Gibby talk about it. This brain has lots of different pieces and everything. This was not at his deposition. We haven't had our experts review this. We've never seen it in a three-dimensional format so until in rule, this what, in minute. Rule, what's your objection? Yeah, what's the problem? Untimely disclosure. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Was this disclosed as a demonstrative exhibit? Yes. It's not going to the jury. It's just a. And how was it it's disclosed a as a demonstrative exhibit? In a photo. Then you can use the photos. 
And that was at, just before Fong's deposition? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll sustain the objection if it wasn't uh, disclosed yep. under, rule tw uh, under the guidelines required by Rule 26. They only oh. disclose pictures. They can only use pictures. Picture of the Statue of Liberty. I mean, you know, there I was no objection And to you that. didn't object. So, well, I mean, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I mean, <laughs> no, it's all not. All he wants to it do is, is, is use this, so. use this to explain. I, I understand, Mr. Sykes, and it may be perfectly happen. fine, but he's objected to it, and the rule wasn't followed, and so I must uphold the rule. And do we, do we oh, need to, are we be ready for the picky. jury or would you like to examine your witness out of the, the hearing? Jury's of the jury's been there for 40 minutes. I'd like to examine the witness out of the hearing of the jury, but I'd just like to remind the court, <laughs> inform the court, which was not uh, mentioned earlier by the defense, is that uh, at uh, before Dr. Gibby's deposition uh, several years ago. They're going to play rule book with each the, other. Uh, the brain got yeeted. Demonstrative exhibit? No. I should go get my demonstrative, the FMRI. My demonstrative okay. faces. His uh, VITA curriculum, uh, his uh, resume, discloses his publications, uh, peer-reviewed, I assume. Uh, one is uh, oral presentation, <coughs> advanced FMRI for the clinician, Baylor University. He was told oral to fix that cough. advanced applications. And yet here he is, coughing. 2015-2016. <coughs> It hurts my do, ears. Uh, get into it uh, to lay the foundation. <coughs> Just I want to make sure that the court is not misled to think that we're hiding something or something's coming in at the last <coughs> moment. This was disclosed at his deposition, which was. Um, I hate this man right now. The one coughing. Uh, I don't think you're, two, hiding. I don't think you're hiding anything, Mr. Yeah, Gilbert. And, and it's nothing new. <laughs> Yeah, August 4th of Ew. 2021, plus they have it's the, the attorney. Uh, the, uh, in it's, the initial disclosure, it's not Bueller, it's the other attorney. That. So it's almost two years that they've had this. And now on oh. the second day of trial, they object. All day yesterday. Uh, so he did it would all like day yesterday. The for the FMRI uh, discussion that Dr. Gibby will have during his presentation in front of the jury. Okay. All day, all damn day yesterday. You may proceed. Dr. Gibby is now on the stand outside the presence of the jury to do a 404 hearing. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give in the case now before the court will the be the truth? The freaking coughing is going and nothing to but the end truth, me. So help you, God. Thank you. Good morning. You're, you're laying the foundation, but would you state your full name and spell it for the record, please? Wendell Harlan Gibby. W E N. This is going to be the first witness. L E N G I B B Y. Thank you. Um, your Honor, if I may, instead of going through the long <coughs> background and education, uh, could I do an abbreviated one? or? or you're laying a foundation, you counsel. To support okay. your request that this witness be able to talk about his database. Hey, uh, Dr. Gibby, we'll go into it later, but can you uh, quickly tell the court? Oh, can you uh, quickly tell give me the one court sec, that was me. Uh, your background and uh, training and where you are right now and the work you're doing in neuroradiology and what's related to your testimony today? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm a medical doctor trained at University of Utah. Uh, residency in Diagnostic Radiology at the University of Arizona, a fellowship in Neuroradiology at the University of Pennsylvania, and I am currently an adjunct professor of radiology at the University of California, San Diego. I have a private practice Did in I get radiology that one right? in Provo, Tell Utah. me if I got it right. Okay. Um, next, I'd like to uh, just focus in for now on the fMRI that uh, uh, the discussion that uh, we'd like to present the jury today. Tell us about uh, the foundation or the reliability or the uh, work that's gone into your sort of FMRI. Oh, I got it right. And okay, good, thanks. If you could Chat. explain it for the court uh, so we have a clear picture. 
the issue here is so whether he can talk about a, a technique wherein database we regarding brain injuries. The activation of the brain. It's it was first described in the 1990s, <clears throat> where it, um, as the brain consumes oxygen, it changes the signal intensity of the brain with very subtle changes in the magnetic field, the local magnetic field. And using this technique, uh, doctors around the world have, have applied it to a variety of techniques. I think the first application we used was back in about 1997 or so, when we would use um, the exercises or finger tapping while the patient was in the scanner to identify the motor cortex for neurosurgeons. Okay, I'll be right back. Um, I'm gonna this technique has evolved Fred. over the years to Coming identify you, different areas of brain activation. Um, we moved ahead and uh, in approximately 15 years ago started doing quantitative functional MRI where we would evaluate the activation of different areas of the brain uh, during standard uh, neuropsychological testing. And uh, along that way we uh, developed atlases which you can see in my CV have been presented at various conferences. Um, and a normative database or controls with patients that we perform questionnaires to exclude other medical uh, problems and created um, age-related normative control database for six or seven different neuropsychological tests. I thought Would I had uncredited the Fred. Uh, Your Honor, if uh, we show his uh, Vita on the screen, or uh, I don't have a hard copy to show you right now. To show his Vita? Or resume or uh, curriculum, what do we call it here? CV. CV. I mean, if it would be of some assistance to you, that's fine. Well, to establish the foundation, because this is what was challenged earlier, and uh, we, uh, we we want to make sure it's helpful to the court. So, I, I understood you were making a threshold showing under Rule 702 B as right. to the reliability. Oh, okay. The uh, what is it about your testimony today about this case involving Terry Sanderson's brain injuries that uh, demonstrate the reliability of your use of the fMRI in his case? I know that's a broad question, but uh, that kind of cuts to the chase. Well, I, I think that that uh, I, I'm not a, an attorney, and I'm not under, I'm not sure I understand Rule 702. But I do know from a scientific perspective, in order for data to be valid, you have to um, have controls. It has to be reproducible. You have to perform. Um, uh, statistical testing on this or standard deviations because all people have there's a range of normal and you can't um, you can't use it to make so not heating a um, cell phone across your assumptions office. or to draw conclusions beyond what the data allows you to do and uh, what we the how we have used functional MRI Fred was is to getting into my computer case. Uh, compare quantitatively the the brain activation of patients with various conditions, traumatic brain injury, versus they gave those an eight that day estimate. do not We're on have day two. injury. And we, um, uh, I think some of the distinguishing features so. with what cognitive FX or whatever has been Fred described to the, the court, He's just we have created our own database, not uh, age matched controls. We use a a newer statistical method that received a U.S. patent that allows you to essentially borrow statistical strength from the neighbors. So it's a cubic spline interpolation, which means the data is better. Um, uh, sorry for interrupting. Is this data available to other researchers who want to use it and verify it? And yes. Has that been done? Um, other people have used it. So, for example. Um, we shared this with the University of um, um, Hershey State in uh, oh, Penn State, sorry, in Hershey. Uh, <laughs> Hershey with, State. With uh, clinical researchers. So it's been used at other facilities. 
Um, the the data is is just a normative database that that maps for a given area of the brain and for a given function of the brain what controls will uh, exhibit in their functional testing. Now, we don't try to necessarily draw a one-to-one -one conclusion. We simply say, in this case, we ran this test and this patient was outside of normal. It is a piece of evidence. We're not trying to conclude that it was necessarily the traumatic brain injury that caused that, uh, but in this population with um, this particular test, we have a, a normal data yeah, set, just like you would have a, a blood test, a hematocrit, or a, you know some other medical test. You would create a normative control, and if it falls outside of that range, you would call it abnormal. You might not draw a conclusion as to why their hematocrit Meg, was abnormal. Meg, I think abnormal. this is why there's a camera issue. I don't yeah, think Gwyneth Paltrow likes the now. coverage there anything else about of her face. That would verify and provide a Shelley Apple was on the slope and will be testifying, we've been told, in, case. in opening. Well, we being one of the, the, one of the things that we have done we, that I think has pushed the science forward is we look at the functional areas of activation of the brain. We created maps of where the for example, the frontal language area or the attentional control areas. Uh, earlier attempts have have done this more on just a standard uh, geography, if you would. I, I've made the analogy in my deposition that if you were trying to measure or, or to, to test the hypothesis of, of a population of, of a certain uh, group of people, they don't always um, follow exactly the boundary of the state or the country that they're in. There may be racial um, diversity that's concentrated in a geographic area, but not necessarily a state boundary. So what we have done is to look at um, functional MRI from a functional atlas perspective. But it is data that's available. Uh, certainly, uh, people could could take our our normative controls and compare against whatever um, functional evaluation they do at their facility. We do not close it. And uh, how did you use uh, this um, fMRI technique in this particular case? And uh, what makes you uh, uh, I need you back on 2x speed. Certainty. Oh. Uh, confident that is. Covering this, is this live is going to hurt. They are so Terry slow. Case. So as I said, we, we run a battery of tests, uh, different things that assess higher cortical function like memory and problem solving and, um, and, and language processing and so forth. Um, in Terry's case, all of the tests were pretty much normal. That's actually helpful data Both because you know that someone is trying they're functioning they're not uh, they're not uh, it, it's not a it's not a broken test so to speak in Terry's case though he did have we're not fairly significant abnormalities some. in his matrix reasoning test which is essentially a problem solving uh, that we'll requires see. frontal lobe or higher cortical function testing um, the brain stuff and is so interesting, he, he did have it abnormality is, it uh, he be was drier uh, more than two standard deviations below normal uh, for his brain activation in that particular test. And so we noted that, that, you know, this is a piece of data that suggests um, and compared it a to problem with, with functional brain processing. Now, I'd like to go uh, to relate it to the uh, specifics of Terry Sanderson's case. Uh, you understand he had a concussion. There's evidence of that. Um, how does that concussion uh, uh, inform your work with the fMRI so that you can draw conclusions that uh, might help the jury understand this? This is the point. Well, I of mean, this 404. Uh, Terry had a concussion. I don't think there's anyone in the court that disagrees with that. Um, there are. Medical, uh, we're looking for objective evidence that 
shows whether or not the concussion was There's significant, no whether it persisted, I'm whether of it everyone. impaired his ability to and do what he does. And there is no prosecution in this case. And there are um, historical pieces of information from family, from friends. There's the medical record at the I've time, both today. before and after. And then there's the radiologic imaging. Um, I could be much uh, more critical. In terms of the imaging that I Go was asked to review, there were yesterday. some abnormal findings on the chest X-ray. There were abnormal findings on his abnormal, like MRI of the rims? brain, and there were some abnormalities on the functional scan. So it was just one piece of a multifactorial picture of Terry Sanderson's concussion. I think that's fair. Okay. Brain injuries are dynamic, and him being at normal might not be where he was before, and that's where the comparative analysis comes in. Because normal for Terry Sanderson might not be uh, normal, or normal for normal might not be or? normal just, for uh, Terry Sanderson. So Qu Queen Yang is a researcher at uh, Hershey at um, Hershey, it's Penn State University. Okay, and, sorry, I, I, um, I guess you answered that. Uh, what controls the openings you were for your a bit entertaining. Database? So we run the exact same tests on uh, patients that have no known neurologic problems, and we 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 gathered that data to ask them if they've had other issues, whether it be multiple sclerosis or strokes or whatever. So we, 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 um, uh, it's, it's exactly. This a is what's hard with brain injuries we've, we've, is uh, employed normal, scans whatever that means for a brain, people might not, without neurologic problems. Might not help with the we've impairment acquired this defendant Several felt. hundred patients, the current database that we process is about 50 patients, and that's because as technology evolves, as the MRI scanner has changed, coils change, uh, pulse sequences and so forth change, we try to use a normative control database that reflects our current actual operating practice. Um, so how large is your complete database? Uh, we have several hundred patients in it, but but the process the processing that we do on the current patients is um, you know roughly fifty patients. And when we say reproducible, how is it re reproducible? Well, we've done some testing where we uh, test the same person twice on, on different occasions. We did about 10 patients where we test and you come back and retest and see if the data is the same. That's one measure of reproducibility. Another, um, another fact that we use is we take the knowledge that we have as physicians and that has been garnered over you know a century and a half of neural function from brain surgery, from neurophysiology, from anatomy, et cetera. And um, these and areas Jeremy, of activation that, break, should fit certain patterns. And we see that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's simply not random activation of the brain. So we have the internal controls of the symmetry of action in the brain. We have the uh, control of what is uh, of other data that's um, that that we've studied Karen, over Karen, this is very important decades. information. Thank you. And that uh, coffee and we was, was that killing with, me. With what that normal patient should be doing. Um, please describe your normative your, is so hard uh, with brain function. And other presentations uh, regarding your use of the fMRI that are applicable to the Terry Sanderson case that may provide the foundation for this. For your conclusion. The plaintiff is annoyed Sanderson. that they're having to go through so this, which is clear. So I don't have my CD in front of me, but because you may. So the know, plaintiff just for housekeeping. Oh gosh, uh, how long is this going to go? Ew. This is a relatively done. minor how point. How long are we? Are sitting in the back how long rooms. are we doing this? You brought it up. I think we're just about done. Dr. Fong's ruling was yesterday. Oh. I, 
I don't need a conversation between counsel. Please address the court. <laughs> Thanks, Your Honor. We don't need it either, but we kind of are living for it. But he wants to know, like, how long um, so are this, we uh, doing one this? Of these was a the presentation for the American Society of Neuroradiology at the annual meeting in April 2017, hey, FMRI Atlas for Control Comparison of Six Neurofunctional region using standardized psychological tests. Um, here's another uh, presentation I did at the Radiologic Society of North America. Standardized hey, brain function test, making functional MRI hello. standardized, fast, and physician oh, friendly. I'm be covered in cat hair if you do uh, that, buddy. I gave a presentation at, at Baylor University. I gave one at Penn State in 2016. I gave grand hi. rounds to both University of Pennsylvania and University of California, San Diego on functional MRI. Um, I spoke at the uh, the tw uh, 20th Symposium of the Neuroradiologium, the World Neuroradiology Society all of the in Istanbul, today. Turkey in September 2014. So it, it, there's been quite a few uh, presentations about it. He talks about <clears throat> it a lot. To neuroradiologists and other peers. There's going to be a lot of brain doctors testifying in this case. Thank you. I think that's all I have for now. Okay. I, I just have a couple of questions before Mr. Bellasar, thank you. Uh, I so try the, to remember not to say fuck when I'm on court TV. I do a pretty good job most of the time. Approximately 50 individuals. Yeah, so our database actually That's not a lot. Hundred. But again, to, to keep not the data a lot of people. Uh, consistent, clean, we've used the last 50 patients because uh, we changed uh, MRI scanners here a couple of years ago, so we repeated our normative controls. Okay, and there's some subset of that 50 that uh, has been, or the, that 50 has been split into subsets based on age-related controls. So you can dynamically well, adjust the age bright. range. You okay. can choose the age range. Do you recall how many were in the age range that were uh, compared with <clears throat> the plaintiff's fMRI? Um, I, I don't recall. I think we used about 50, um, about 50 patients, but uh, many of those would have been younger patients. So. And how about, um, ha has there been any effort to uh, quantify statistically the reliability of your normative database? Just to note, this is what yes. a scientific fact, data evaluation test, should look uh, like. Not, I just threw the phone around and it was fine. We threshold of what the standard deviation of the normative controls are and what that patient's activation were. Okay. And is there an established rate of error? Um, it's not a large sample size because sure this is through his own practice. Uh, this isn't used for court. This is for his practice. Probability is so it's not meant that to that be a test. This is meant to be for his practice use. A false so this is within negative his own or practice. false positive. Uh, so if you have two standard deviations, that means the probability is 95% that it falls outside of the normal range. And if it's three standard deviations, it's like 97%. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Egan? I just have a couple questions. You asked many that I was going to, Your Mr. Honor. Egan. All right. EGATS. So I'll just be real brief. Dr. Gibby, uh, good to see you again. Um, does anyone other than your clinic So far, use I like him better. He might be the one I like the best. Uh, as so I far. said, um, Dr. Queen Yang has used it. Uh, okay. Anyone other than him? Um, yes, we set it up at, um, at George yes. Washington University. Uh, a few years ago, um, I had a son attending residency there. I'm, I don't know if they're currently using it, but they, they had used it. Okay. And has anyone, uh, an, any outside researcher, validated your statistical um, I think, analysis? I you think were just Clark talking about over here is, is our favorite test. attorney so far. <laughs> well, I've said we Jen. we presented this. Uh, we might have to start calling him in a peer-reviewed fashion in order to have the abstracts and Apparently, so forth accepted. There have been. Sir, we need to talk about VPR uh, real quick. I assume physicians. Apparently, Raquel's going to the reunion in person. I can't that. even. So we we publicly 
given our results, yes. Okay, but has anyone used your database, run your same tests, um, you know, the various Where are you going, George? functional uh, activities you ask people to do during the scans, okay. and then uh, compared their results with your results, and critically yes. analyzed those. Are you good now? Yes, I mean, that it, when you it's run like the, um, when you run the program, it automatically brings up the normative control group, so you can see the activation of those. So they, they would be using those by default. Uh, you're not only comparing statistically, you're visually comparing the, the activation patterns of these side by side. I think that's another advantage here is you're able to, as a neuroradiologist, compare visibly how these are activating. Okay. Um. I think that's all I have, Your Honor. Thanks. Yay! Thank you. Any follow-up? They're going to be anxious to bring the jury in. They are burning court time. Remember, this is a civil case. This judge has given them a time oh, limit. Say, I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know how many number of years you've been informed by your fMRI testing about how many patients and uh, data points. And data points, is there more than one data point per individual for example the mri does i think thousands the plaintiff has been in and out during this type of testimony so Can i'm not sure where he is at the moment so in order to which i think when gwyneth paltrow sits there all day every day functional is activation you need going to be lots difficult of data and for the plaintiff to overcome not so being there each test that we run has about 1800 images per test and there will be seven tests at least so, this you know, is an evidentiary hearing about outside the presence of the jury to decide what the case. jury's going to hear. It takes several hours of processing. So each uh, individual or each, let's say, 50 uh, patients has... Uh, There's hundreds of thousands of images, images in, in the patient database, yes. Okay. And... Um, I was trying to get an image of uh, George. You change your machines every sh so often and you have to recalibrate them, right? I don't know about re what do you mean by recalibrate, but these, um, um, we just get better signal to noise. So as technology moves, we want to have the best uh, Barnabas, data that we yes, can Barnabas, yes, the get. database so, is on trial at the moment. Uh, a few That's years exactly ago when we happening. upgraded our MRI machine, we Implant re Texas, all of you. the statistical controls. How many years ago was that? Uh, it's been probably three years ago. I'm streaming off and on. <laughs> now, a larger population of tests were openings each were a bit of a mess. Thousand per individual. Um, that uh, has statistical significance, in your opinion. Yeah, I mean, I. I'm, I think that the data speaks for itself. We're you can have see just on the images the quality the of the the color representations of, of how the data is displayed. This is a 404 displayed, hearing outside but, the presence of the jury. Um, I think it's very good data. Kind of like the old black and white TV, and now you get the digital high definition TV. Uh, it's uh, we've improved the uh, we we decreased the noise by. A, about a factor of a square root of two, 1.4 times in the last um, few years. So the statistical, um, and we published on this, in fact, we received a patent on this. Um, we are getting better images than we did 10 years ago. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Could you explain the patent? Beyond uh, the scope. Uh, yeah, objection, Your Honor. I think this is beyond the yeah, He mentioned the patent the first few minutes of my He did. Overruled. Go ahead. So fMRI images are very signal limited. All MRI images are noisy, but what you're looking for is a really subtle change in the signal intensity because the brain is using more oxygen. Okay, so you're looking at a very subtle change in, in signal to noise. And the patent that we did was to do um, a cubic spline interpolation like of the data, which essentially you look at your neighbors. So if you think about, if you saw a droplet of water in the sky, you might say, oh, could that be random or is rain coming? But no, if you I saw would say, have I become a vampire? Why could I see a droplet of water of in the sky? Of water, you would say, it's a rainstorm, right? And, and so we essentially look at the 
neighbors Only of, the, of a particular off. voxel, and and we say, is this Sorry, noise or is it not? And it turns out, if if the neighbors are activating, then it's more likely that you are also that, that yours is not a random noise, you know. Um, so. So they by, do have time limits doing in this that, PCR. Uh, more advanced statistical I don't know exactly what they are for each side yet. I haven't heard the court a, say, but they do have improvement in the signal. They do have time limits. Images. They are burning Thank it you. right now. Thank you. Any follow up, Mr. Egan? There were some. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gibby. You may step down. Thank you. Yay! Any comments before the court rules? They have to explain. They no, have to explain. Uh, it's a 404. That's why they're doing statistics it. Statistics are. Uh, uh, dependent, I think, on numbers, and he just explained the difference. There are t uh, tens of thousands per individual of those 50 for his normative database, and uh, that adds up to a lot. And as we know, the higher the uh, uh, data points, the that adds up more to a reliable lot is the, the uh, official testimony uh, statistical here. Statistical analysis is. Mr. Egan? Your Honor, uh, just a couple quick points. Uh, the database, as I understand it, involve just 50 patients, which seems like a unreliably small sample size, especially given that it was a lot of young patients, um, different than Terry Sanderson's profile. It's a fair it's not argument. generally used, uh, his database and methods. And then I didn't, I don't believe I heard anything that uh, about his particular control, uh, data, the, the database that's used to control his um, findings being scrutinized. I heard that it was used and has been seen by people but not critically examined by outsiders. Those would be my points. Okay. Thank you. If you give me just a minute. All right. The court is going to rule. I'm going to answer some questions while the court is looking for what they're looking for. The lawyer coughing is disrupting proceedings. Yeah, it was awful yesterday. It seems to be under control now. That lawyer needs to be working the cough drops. Lauren said shout out to my mom, Dolores in her Nato MS. I'm here with her as she recovers from surgery and converting her to a Lonard. Hello, recover well, rest well, okay. hydration Under is key. Under Rule 702B, which is what the court's uh, ruling on. We're on 702B. Uh, the uh, the scientific, scientific technical, or other specialized knowledge may serve the, as the basis for an expert testimony if there's a threshold showing as that the principles or methods are reliable based on sufficient facts or data and been reliably applied to the facts. Um, the, the, uh, this is part of the court's gatekeeper function to screen out unreliable expert testimony and the court is required to uh, use like rational skepticism in, in evaluating this. What the court's focused on is the this normative database and what conclusions that the witness may be drawing from this normative database, whether it's whether there's been a threshold showing of reliability. And there's different standards in the federal court versus Utah. They may they may be the same uh, in this instance, but I'm applying the Utah standard, which I believe that that the witness has provided a threshold showing of reliability of of, the, of their normative database. So that database, database is coming in. That uh, their testimony regarding the database sure is coming that in. The database is, That's what that is recognized as scientifically valid, that it contains controls, that it's reproducible, and that it's subject to statistical testing, and that this MAP database had all of that. Um, while the, the number of um, patients in that database uh, seems to be small, the, uh, the uh, witness did on a threshold basis. Um, and I'm not commenting on the weight or how great the evidence is, but on a threshold basis, satisfy the court that uh, that there is sufficient um, reliability applying those factors. The court also considered um, whether it had been tested and, and or per, the subject of peer review analysis or publication. Um, there's been some publication of the of the database as well as it. That's being why they were talking about the lectures. Independent peers. Although it doesn't sound as though anyone has actually tested it or written it up, it has been out in the marketplace of scientific ideas for many years, or several years anyway, uh, that would permit that sort of analysis. Um, and based on the application of statistics to the database, as the witness has described, it is uh, the, uh, the reliability of, 
of the findings are scientifically testable. Broncos country, I think that's a fair point. So I will overrule the objection. Do we have Butler and Cameron over there? Anything further before it might the, be. the uh, d um, Nick, jury comes in? thank you. It is okay. I'm glad okay. you're getting to a pain We're management doctor. Jury. Thank you. The jury has been waiting for an hour. The jury has been waiting for an hour. You know what the law nerds did recently while they're getting ready to pull the jury in? I got two new sound changers or sound effects. So law nerds, thank you. We're gonna bust these open today and uh, see see what we have because this trial is gonna need gonna need some sound effects. I think we're gonna we're gonna SFX the trial. It sounds like they're gonna be bringing in the jury. I'm gonna answer some questions in super chats. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you all for making this the number one place to watch live trials. Um, Y'all are gonna be real bummed when I have to leave this afternoon for a little bit. We'll see what we do if we keep the stream rolling to let y'all chat. We'll just have to see what's going on. We'll consider it, we'll consider it. Um, Ward Wizarding World said, since she's lawyered up, why is she present? Gwyneth Paltrow is a plaintiff and a defendant in this case. She has to be present. If you can't be bothered to show up, the jury is not going to award you anything. Wouldn't insurance cover an accident? I have no idea what kind of insurance would cover a ski accident. I don't know if skiing is exempt. I am not that much of a skier. I haven't skied since I was in my early 20s, you know, because I have orthopedic injuries. And after my ACL was torn, I was not skiing anymore. I didn't want to risk it. My brother and sister-in-law are avid skiers, but wouldn't insurance cover it? I don't know what kind of insurance would cover a ski accident. I don't know if a personal umbrella policy would cover something like that. It looks like the jury is coming in. Fred, I thought we talked about this streaming EDB. Yeah, he thinks he is in charge of the camera. <laughs> um, Diana said, my son had a concussion in third grade. I'm sorry. And his personality was permanently changed. He went from outgoing sociable kid to an introverted quiet boy. That is kind of the testimony we heard at the end of the day yesterday about this seated. plaintiff. Brain injuries thank you and good morning, can members be of the jury. absolutely devastating. Um, thank you for your patience sorry this morning. For that experience. The, the, the lawyers are this working very hard, hard as a parent. to move the case along. Um, I hope that uh, you weathered the storms on your way in here today. Stormy! Seemed to be coming and going as time went on. Um, but we're ready to proceed. Mr. Bueller, do you have a witness? Yes, Your Honor. Bueller. The plaintiff calls Dr. Wendell Gibby. Dr. Gibby, you can take the stand. Dr. Gibby was already sworn in by the court before you arrived. All right, Dr. Gibby. Let's hear it. I like this judge quite a lot. All right, morning, Dr. Dr. Gibby, Gibby is now in front of the testimony or in front of the jury. Uh, could you uh, please uh, state your name and uh, tell us uh, where you come from or where you were born and where you grew up? It's probably more than you want to know. Uh, it's it's <laughs> Wendell Arlen Gibby. I was born in Idaho, grew up mostly in Utah, and I've lived in a lot of places around the country. Okay, starting with high school, uh, please tell us uh, your educational background. Starting so with high school? I went to high school Shit. at Orem High. I attended Brigham Young University and graduated in chemistry. Went to University of Utah in medical school. Uh, from there, I did a diagnostic radiology residence. Well, I did an internship in um, um, just, it was a rotating internship at UCLA Harbor General, a county hospital oh. in Los Angeles. Hey, hey. And then a uh, diagnostic UCLA radiology residency at University of Arizona and a fellowship in I used to have to go uh, pick up some there all the time because they University covered Pennsylvania. my courthouse. I've taught at three universities. Covered uh, the area where Harbor, a while. Area where was Harbor a, General uh, was. Young staff member at University of Utah. So, I taught both we neuroradiology and interventional radiology with at University visits. of Arizona for approximately three time. years. And I'm currently an adjunct professor of radiology at University of California, San Diego. Uh, so he's a professor at UC San Diego. Please explain what radiology is in layman's terms, if you could briefly. Radiology is imaging, uh, comprises x-rays, uh, MRI, CT, ultrasound, those types of things, as well as a growing practice is Me the image-guided treatment or interventional radiology. So um, various treatments of Need cancer where, and that's exactly what I thought of problems too. With, with image-guided therapy. Is I don't know if the judge went to BYU because unlike those the, who went to University of South Carolina, they don't all tell us all the time. 
but maybe. Um, well, I... Um, Megan, thank you for the super chat. I founded I'll a software business uh, many years ago, and um, <laughs> we've done a lot of advanced imaging. So we currently are involved with an augmented reality guidance product. Emergency uh, chicken is here. Done a number of advanced imaging technologies over the years. Um, we have about 200 employees and are in about a thousand facilities around the world. Okay. I guess That's a lot I of guess facilities. Some training uh, by default. Okay. Um, describe the types of uh, patients you treat. Justice for all said, so who ran into who? That's what we're here for. So we see a, a wide spectrum of, of patients with imaging. Today they're talking um, about injuries. As a neuroradiologist, I've focused on the brain and spine, but we see a wide spectrum in, uh, in our clinic in Provo. Uh, we also read for a half a dozen other facilities around the state. I guess if you're going okay, to uh, what are the types deal with head of, uh, injuries, an area with a lot of, of skiing patients, uh, is helpful. problems do you see? Um, for example, brain injury? Definitely. Uh, athletic injuries, uh, sports, Football. concussions, yeah. uh, automobile and, uh, you know, motor vehicle injury. Um, we diagnose and treat a fair number of people with other neurologic conditions like multiple sclerosis, strokes, dementia, um, a lot of degenerative problems in people's spines, disc herniations, those types of things. And, um what about uh, rib Leslie, injuries I covered or, them yesterday uh, injuries to the torso. on the stream, and I'm going to put up a separate like video with those just to watch it. We haven't named the pickle yet. Is it within the scope of your training and uh, specialty to d determine the causation of traumatic brain injury? Yes. How so? Really? Could you explain that. Well, um, neuroradiology is the science of imaging and diagnosis. Um, so we see virtually any patient that has a significant head injury will at some point come through our imaging with CT or MRI. Um, I also run an urgent care facility at our multi-specialty clinic that I own. Uh, I've written textbooks on imaging. I wrote a 2,000-page neuroradiology textbook many years ago that, uh, of course, was an exhaustive review of the literature and, uh, and different cranial problems. He clearly uh, loves his field. Problems. Debbie so, Hall, Terry Sanderson was 69 at the time of the accident in 2016. Injury. What about rib injuries? Are you qualified to discuss those and how so? Well, you know, I also uh, am involved with general radiology. We read lots of plain x-rays. Um, when I was at uh, Utah Valley Hospital. I was there for about 15 years. I was chairman of the department for a couple of years. We had a, we had a large uh, population of trauma patients coming in. It was a tertiary referral center. Uh, also, when I was at University of Utah and at University of Arizona, we had large populations of trauma patients coming in. And, you know, that body injury, rib trauma is a, is a common problem in in trauma patients. It's, it's, it's a common process, so it's, uh, any general radiologist should be qualified to. A Hollywood attorney, good to see you in the chat. I completely agree with you. A lot of and people would not sit through a trial every really single day. It, estimate, I think it's critical uh, that they do, but a lot of people wouldn't. Uh, patients have you seen over your career? Appreciate the insight. Maybe approximately how many scans have you seen, radiological scans? Um, tens of thousands. I, 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 a Allison lot. Dunning, so thank you. Typically, a radiologist will see roughly 100 patients a day. Um, so over a, you know, 250-day year and a 30-year career, you could do the math. But we see lots of images. Okay. Um, if you could explain for the jury, uh, what is a closed head injury or a closed head brain injury? Uh, it's trauma that involves the inside or the, the, the cranial contents, but doesn't necessarily break the skull or 
lacerate the skull. So um, typically some type of deceleration injury. The human cranium, of course, is a marvelous organ. Uh, we do incredible <laughs> things as humans. I love his excitement um, about But his one of the things that it's was not very cool. built or designed for is rapid deceleration. And so we see lots of head injuries in uh, in sports, in yes, we were made to trauma, like whack into each other at um, high speeds, and uh, we, that so wasn't the, what the we brain were set is up bathed in this bath of CSF fluid that acts as a shock absorber. But if it if the the skull stops quickly and the brain doesn't stop, it will Sloshes. strike or bounce around inside the skull, and it can create shock waves um, of energy that will disrupt fiber connections in the brain. So is a close to head brain injury the same as a traumatic brain injury or TBI? Yes. And explain what a MTBI is and how it compares to other TBIs. What? Well, <laughs> He's like, um, um, there's different gradations of TBI. So traumatic brain injury uh, can be, um, you know, Everything from a person is comatose and decerebrate and non-functional to transient. You're going to have uh, to explain you know, decerebrate, sir. Um, You're in front of a jury. We see He's lots not looking of, at the jury uh, at all, which is interesting. In repeated He's uh, traumatic at the brain injury, lot. where um, and I think even, he's good at explaining. Even short I'd duration like to see him look at the jury injuries a little bit. can have fairly the profound sequelae. Jury That's, is that's been from the monitor um, the jury's to the other side of the monitor process in the news in the last few years with the uh, nfl and other sports programs but uh yeah it's it's just an issue of gradation he does seem well qualified and um just explain for us because it's been and he enjoys about. what he does and i Post love that in an expert when you can see that uh, they really love their uh, job explain what those are so post-concussion syndrome well, for Symptoms. the human brain to work, um, there's a lot of interconnectedness that has to happen. And the the simple things that we would do, like move our arm or breathe or... Now he's looking at the jury. You know, um, I think explaining and looking at the jury is It doesn't take a lot of brain function. It brings them into the conversation. Some of the higher cortical functions that we have in terms of emotional control... It's like looking at the in judges terms and of, cheerleading um, or figure skating or executive functioning problem solving judges like that. um multitasking i mean you think of the the, the billions the of interconnections that have to happen in order for the brain to to function correctly and so unlike say if you were to pluck out a part of the brain the the problems with a um with a concussion tend to be more generalized they they tend to affect systems so people often exhibit memory challenges memory requires a lot of interplay of the brain they will have depression so emotional ability people will find that they can't control their anger as well the frontal lobes are Lability vital for could be explained creating better. we need to bring it down you know the the normal personal relationships and, and control of how we act to, to people. And if those areas get damaged, uh, people don't have the same ability to control their emotions. Um, oftentimes, it will reflect Robin in Stanley, sleeplessness, in so difficulty with sleeping. For over $3 million. Um, so there's, you know, there's a, there's a wide variety of symptoms that people will have after a concussion. And it can be somewhat variable in terms of how they resolve or whether they resolve at all. Uh, how many people suffering a concussion, in your experience with your training, completely recover? This is a paced courtroom. Well, the vast majority. I mean, That's I think sure. I saw a statistic a few years back in collegiate sports or something like 300,000 concussions a year. So there's a lot of people that bang into each other and they will sustain brief loss of consciousness and you know they'll ring their bell so to speak so the vast majority of people get better after a concussion but what about those who don't uh, how many are 
you know, approximately? Or um, I think that again is a is a factor related to age, underlying problems. Um, so, a, a twenty year old is more likely to recover from a concussion than an eighty year old. Someone who has a single concussion is more likely to re to recover than someone who has repeated injuries. Uh, someone who has an underlying brain problem, um, and their their brain problem. is you know currently functioning well, but this Mine can only tip them over the to create and movie quotes uh, dysfunction. So I don't know what that statistic is, uh, and I'm I think. It's probably the wrong question uh, because <laughs> what you really I love that. should Council ask is actually, no. has it happened and what evidence is that it persists? You know, the, because once if it occurs, it's it's a hundred percent probability. It's a hundred percent probability that that person has a concussion and has symptoms. And what are those uh, symptoms that typically persist? Let's say in someone like Terry Sanderson, who was 69 at the time of this crash. Yeah, so so Terry actually, if you if you read his record, which is fairly extensive, and the depositions of people that uh, had known Terry very well, his partner, his children, his friends, um, Terry had been a very high functioning, high energy person. He was. And that Every day doing lots yeah. of things, uh, meetup groups, skiing, wine tasting, uh, uh, volunteering for various organizations and so forth. Um, but after his accident, he deteriorated abruptly. And many of the activities that he used to do, he stopped doing, like dancing, uh, for the most part, his skiing activities, his personal interactions with his Children and his grandchildren and I think that's suffered. Uncontroverted he had in trouble this, multitasking. He in this normally case. could, you know, handle multiple projects at once, but he would have to sit there and focus very hard on on one task. He would go to Home Depot, for example, and forget why he was there. What, what, you know, what was he I, supposed I to get there? And in one occasion in the record, he describes having to call the police to come and pick him up because he's lost his car. When, when he was hiking. That's unfortunate. Something that hadn't happened to him before. Um, he, he, his girlfriend uh, expressed not this super controversial. change How, where he had this emotional lability. He would get angry. Is the he problem. would be uh, very emotional about things, which was atypical for Terry. Um, so uh, he also experienced a worsening of his depression. Thank you, Ms. Um, so those are very typical hallmarks of someone who has had a traumatic brain injury. That uh, someone who has persistent uh, post-concussive symptoms uh, that last longer than a, let's say a year and a half, are those, uh, what, what does that mean for someone like Terry? Chad, I see population. you guys talking about age-related. The thing is not well, the age-related; it's think the that, change um, in you know, him in from before case, the a, incident to after. That's the been point. A, a physician, an optometrist. He uh, was a very this active was not guy. His he was normal. Well respected by his family. Had a close relationship with his daughters, um, and um, but I think he lost some of that connectedness. Is he would be angry with his grandchildren, for example. In the record, it talks about an incident where he's, you know, yelling at his granddaughter for closing a door or something. Uh, just difficulty maintaining friendships, difficulty um, he was suing for IIED. with the relationships the that he had, he the, the Only partner negligence. that he was with. They split. Um, they, um, you know, I, I think that the ability to function at a high level was lost for Terry. It required him. He could function. He still functions. And he was a bright guy to begin with, so certainly capable of, of doing most things. But many of the things that gave him pleasure in life and 
many of those friendships and relationships seem to have been abruptly um, diminished by this injury. Uh, you mentioned the Okay, Roselli. Uh, yes, those are the uh, rules. The jury some Whoever's of the further downhill has the right of way. There's an argument over who was further so downhill. So I reviewed. Um, That's not what this testimony goes course, to. This goes to injury. Oh, first, did you meet with, uh, examine or meet with Dr. S or Terry Sanderson? I did meet with Terry, uh, examined him briefly. Uh, we did some advanced imaging of his brain, both anatomic imaging. We saw some findings that were uh, consistent with normal pressure hydrocephalus. We did CSF flow imaging, uh, and we also did some functional brain imaging. So that was the primary reason for I meeting hope the Terry, asked, but I did get a chance that? to talk to him and spend about a half an hour with him. Um, I also reviewed all of the imaging, because that's what I am as a radiologist, um, that uh, included images that were done shortly after the accident, a CT scan, um, the day following his injury, uh, rib uh, x-rays and chest x-rays that were performed the day after his injury, um, follow-up MRI uh, images of his brain, of his thoracic spine, et cetera, that were done at a, a facility called Cognitive FX. And then the images, of course, that, that we performed uh, several years later. And, and for the medical record, I reviewed uh, notes from the Veterans Hospital, um, literally hundreds of pages of, Megan, of various not in this uh, case. medical records. The accident report well, number, he has not from been Deer charged Valley, yet. Uh, you know, the ski report incident. Um, um, reviewed the depositions of his children, two, two of his daughters, and his partner, and his friend, Craig Ramon. And, Joe, that's uh, really helpful information. Thank you. I reviewed the uh, testimony of other expert witnesses that were provided, so a, a lot of data. Did you also review the uh, defense's uh, expert reports? I did. I like I being able to see the judge in the in the mirror in the background. Memory. Actually, there's a Galit Askenazi. <laughs> I, kinda, I like the uh, neuropsychologist. I like that. There's hers. no split screen I do. because of the decorum Angela, order. Uh, she, um, another with this. Um, so neuropsychologist we're, is Angela That's where we're Eastfold. at with that. Yes. And then um, and these are the next three are MDs: Robert Hesch, Stephen Edgley, and Carl Black. You reviewed those too. Yes. Gonna be, uh, I don't know if you can see the screen. And if it's MJ okay asked, judge, do lawyers take uh, crash courses in medical field they're involved with? Sure. Sometimes they rely on Just experts. Just want to make sure we pick up the audio as well. Sometimes they rely on their the experts. Um, Oops, that's my uh, if they stay in one field where they deal with a lot of one kind of injury, you do pick up knowledge, but you rely heavily on your experts to learn. And then from other lawyers in the field, show. Oh, you have sorry, to have some competence to understand it. Plain, uh, plaintiff's exhibits. Um, Sue, I did hear that. There is a nurse on the panel, which will be helpful when they get to damages, but you have to find somebody show liable first. Exhibit three first. Who the caused this those, accident? Uh, one. Or did they both? They're the same ones you showed. But they've. Plaintiff's three has already been received. The plaintiff has okay. to deal with scheduling two, um, meaning so they have to deal with show, uh, when these witnesses well, are available. So Social it's not that you get to three. liability first. It's all going to get kind of mixed together. I'm going to get to questions while there's a pause. Emily said $3 million in damages is wild. Um, yeah, I don't. That's what they're asking for. That's what they said in Plaintiff's Exhibit Three because they're looking at like loss of enjoyment of life and, and things like that, the compensatory damages. No punitive see, damages uh, in this case. Bueller, Bueller, your thingy. <laughs> fix the thingy. I'm going to answer some questions while Bueller is trying to fix his thingy. Victoria, we're not covering all day today. I do have some interviews today. 
Um, we'll take a break at lunch and then we'll figure it out from there. Yesterday, the plaintiff lawyer mentioned that Paltrow might so, uh, have had the date of the incident. front of the line Dr. perk. Levy, Wouldn't that, that make hey, her in front of him? No, hey, I'll talk was, about that. Uh, time of the incident. Darn it. I'll talk about that later. Yeah, just before noon. But I will talk about that more later. Um, it, the, the name of the student is deleted, uh, but I'll represent that it's uh, Bexy, I will talk about this. Yeah, we have that elsewhere. This um, has to do with damages. Steer right, bandana, slight pitch before flat. They have to top. prove all of that, but this has um, to do with damages. Then I'm going to show you the. Um, so I think there's a problem here. Glenn Paltrow was not a student. So but I, that's what was written on the report. I think we have that elsewhere. Look at this it attorney. Deleted, He's just I like, think, for excuse me. Child? I'm quite sure. I think it was done to protect uh, the privacy, and that's why it was deleted here. But it's not the child. This is there are he doesn't agree with the report. Children here, but I'll. Uh, what, uh, the main thing I wanted to show is uh, um, that uh, the person filling out this report. There's not uh, supposed Eric to be Christensen speaking says, objections, it, and he just keeps doing it. Heard a, her screen. You've reviewed this report, correct, Dr. Gibby? I have. Then down below, I'm going to go just go down Cheryl, to the bottom. Cheryl, it didn't change and my opinion says, about the case. I'm waiting to see how it comes up in the case. So I'm waiting to see how it comes up. up. And, uh, if you didn't watch today's Emily show, guess, it's available. Uh, we talk about the motions in um, Lemonade. mentions the other instructor, Carrie Oaks. And in addition to saying um, I didn't see it, he also indicates down here, did you witness the incident? No. He said, I saw the immediate aftermath. Um, and uh, then it says, uh, uh, do you see where it says both were in discomfort? I do. And during lunch, she talked of being stiff and sore. Uh, I believe that would reference the, the student there, which I, I think we'll be able to show later that it, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's name was there because this was the one provided to the plaintiff when he asked for a record of what happened. Um, so uh, uh, does, does this uh, idea that uh, both were in discomfort, does that inform you that uh, there may have been an, a traumatic event after this ski collision that caused injury? Objection meeting. Uh, what it, Over, what, what, overruled. It's foundational. Well, I don't think it's in question that there was a collision. And Oops. The two individuals were involved in a collision on the ski slope, so I, I, I'm not sure what. I mean, yes, they, they both they both were injured. Uh, I just want to quickly go through these, but it, I'll try to be fast. Um, let's see. There we go. Come on. Now, this is Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. I moved to Allie, admit Plaintiff's I covered Exhibit 1, the part of opening of yesterday the ski patroller, at the end of my Whitney stream. Smith. Would it help, it chat? I'm going to put up a poll. Oh, sorry, you're on it. Oh, gosh. Any I'm going to put up a poll and see if it would okay. help if I Plaintiff's split that into its own video. Because I can do that and put it up. Okay. Um, we can see this is Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. Again, it's the same date. You see that, right? I do. And it says injured person, Terry Sanderson. And then uh, uh, location, bandana. Collision, yes. I'll do it if it's helpful. Let me put up a poll. With unknown other party, not present. And the description of the skier is advanced intermediate and uh your honor i apologize to interrupt but I, i'm wondering is if there an objection there's a question okay instead uh, of just reading through the record did this uh, objection record no question you to as a basis of your opinion i guess no speaking objections is just I did not review the this rule. record yes okay uh, we'll get back to this one later can you make it a short? Cynthia, I did do a short summarizing yesterday. That's already up on QuickBits. So I do have a short summarizing yesterday. I know it's hard to listen to in real time. There's a benefit for doing these things in summary where you're not I'm dealing with the court. Briefly go back pauses. to this. 
Um, Bexy, question, how is this relevant to establishing negligence? It's not. This is to damages. They have to prove both negligence and page two of, damages. Uh, exhibit one. So those are going to go out of order due to scheduling and, says, and things uh, like that. Uh, what did or you strategy. Do? Um, assessment, mild disorientation and rib pain, right side. Do you see that? Did, that, did this- uh, Mr. Sanderson was there part of the day yes. yesterday, but and not a lot. Transport via toboggan to EFA, which I understand is Empire First Aid. Reassessment, disorientation, All right, you lesson. guys, the poll is up. You can keep voting. Uh, I'm going to leave that up for How a little does bit. Or what does disorientation mean to you uh, after a ski collision like this? Uh, it's symptoms of a head injury. Okay. Uh, just the page three, I'd like to know. Um, okay, I'm going to go back to page one. Um, I forgot to emphasize this. Uh, uh, do you see where it says was hit from behind? Yes. That's the injured's description of the incident. I'm going to go to page three, and you'll note the date at the bottom of page three. It wasn't February 26, 2016. It was three weeks later, March 18, 2016. So the author of this okay. report, Whitney Smith, wrote a supplement. Do you see that? I do. I saw okay. the argument over scheduling at the end of the day and So she yesterday. didn't write this the first time. Yes, I did. Uh, she didn't have the name of the other party uh, on the report, but she did have this written. I, um, let's see, I can't read it myself. Let's see, what does that word? Oh, I recall, because she's recalling three weeks later, that upon arriving on the scene on Bandana at the bridge, I found patient Terry Sanderson. Rhonda, yeah, the issue the of right. injury, the issue of damages is separate from the issue of negligence. Um, but they have to prove both. There so, was, uh, and trials uh, don't always go in order due to scheduling, especially with experts coming in from out of state. On the right side of the run in, in his skis. The mountain host that radio patrol was above doing traffic control. Lisa, Terry's I don't know if we know that she a left the scene man, for a fact. That fact jacket, is still in dispute. Black pants, dark hair, hereby referred to as large male friend. I'll represent to you that no new charges that large have been male filed friend, against Fred. Uh, testified yesterday. His name is Craig Ramon. But uh, you read this vandalism uh, of, of a hard drive too, and a camera uh, yeah. is on the table. Terry said that he was uncertain what happened. Large male friend told Terry that a woman had struck him from behind, knocking him down. Large male friend stated he believed the woman had been Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, does that inform your opinion? Large male friend about, testified uh, what yesterday. In the ski crash? Yes. Just FYI. Okay, and it looks like uh, I asked, uh, Whitney Smith writes three weeks later, I asked if anyone had spoken to the woman. Large male friend said it, he had asked her if she was all right. He said she had told him she was fine and skied away. During, but this is three weeks later, so um, uh, during the assessment, transport, and time at the first aid, large male friend. This doctor is a paid expert, the involved in the not the initial treating physician. They do not have to be separate. Um, and then it goes on to describe at Empire First Aid, we were met by three others from Terry's skiing group a blonde woman, a man, and Debbie. I recall large male friend reiterating to the group his identification of the woman to have been Gwyneth Paltrow. Debbie Todd, left to retrieve no, those the are just the mirrors in the park. courtroom. And the other three friends left a while later to continue skiing. Nothing behind them, I to my with, knowledge. I stayed it's and monitored court, Terry those until are built Debbie into arrived the in the car and took him to the clinic. Then she writes at the bottom, I believe the other party, LMF, was Craig. Autumn, uh, this happened in 2016. Craig, the Craig, lawsuit was Craig. not brought till 2019. With me because, they uh, were talking settlement, to, uh, then there was a panini, to set the foundation and now we're in trial. What happened and uh, so. what informs your opinions? Let's see. Ashley, in the chat, not a dumb question. This is a civil case. Money is what's on the line here and a determination of liability. So this is not a criminal case. The, unless one of the photographers continues to piss off the court, there are criminal sanctions 
for violating the decorum order in this court. I will pull the decorum order and cover it tomorrow um, or post it on social because, yeah. You know, I'm I'll gonna show it. you a progress note. Uh, plain, uh, sorry. The Your expert Honor. looks I'd like to, uh, annoyed with the questions here. I'd like to admit uh, plaintiff's exhibit four. Great, all right. Emily, with all the objections and opening that were sustained, no. wasn't the shit out of the horse already, though? Received. It was, but it does matter that they were sustained because it signals to the jury, and it depends on the jurors, but it signals to the jury that the attorney is trying this to is get into something they're not allowed to, the and that can feel shady to lawyers or to jurors. It's not clear what time, whether that's a 24-hour <laughs> clock or not. Um, He's trying to fix the microphone. Island Lady job. is what the plaintiff's friends say admissible and yes by this michael McMahon. this witness is he allowed to consider it and, and provide testimony but this is what he wrote about this this witness is allowed to date, consider it for uh, his expert opinion vital signs weight 177 pounds and then uh said uh, patient collided with another skier at approximately 1300 today this is why the 915 is not clear whether that is a that may not be a time that uh, corresponds to any real time. Uh, it could be a clock that's not set or something. But at 1300 today, that would be 1 p.m., oh, correct? Gosh. Delilah, different yeah. anyway, cases have uh, different statute of limitations. Some are two years, some are three years, some are more. Responded. Patient was helmeted. Um, Nana, I was on court TV last then night. Then it says complains mild headache and pain when taking a deep breath. I don't know what when I'll be back on. What does that indicate to you, Dr. Gibby? It depends on time. Well, he was evaluated by a physician assistant at an Instacare. Um, it, it's clear that he had um, some chest symptoms with his, he was having trouble breathing, having pain with, with deep breaths. The ribs and would do that. He had had some period of loss of consciousness, which was- Hi, George reported by the provider. What do you uh, need, it dude? sounded like that uh, the provider suggested a CT scan, but Terry declined it. Why would he uh, I think that there was enough, it? certainly enough uh, injury to warrant concern for a CT scan. And then at the bottom it says, after brief discussion to determine stability, patient was referred to the emergency room by private vehicle for CT scan and further evaluation. Uh, does that support the opinion that uh, Terry suffered a concussion that day? I was on closing day, arguments last night. I don't know if they've put it on YouTube yet. It does, and he ultimately had a CT scan and images of his of his broken ribs. Okay. I know that CT scans are expensive, but but with the injury that he was complaining of. It seems odd to turn it down. Um, I, I apologize for making you go through all these simple records, but they're important. Oh, um, but they're important. Is there a Honor, question pending? Uh, I move to admit plaintiff's exhibit five. Is he forgetting to admit his exhibits? No. Okay. Plaintiff's Exhibit 5 is received. You have to sue for some amount of money. A dollar is symbolic, much like when Taylor Swift no. sued the photographer that grabbed her ass. She sued for a dollar. You have to sue for something you can't. Well, you can. there are certain types of declaratory relief. We're not going to get into that at the moment. But when you're suing for monetary damages, it is a symbolic number. It's not that Gwyneth Paltrow needs the money to pay for medical bills, right? It's a find him so this is dated responsible, February 27th, not the me, day after the collision. and then find, um, it's find the for me with the money. It's the emergency department. Uh, I'll represent that it's the uh, Veterans Hospital. Um, All right. Sometime, uh, George, I, I know we're bored. Somewhere. What time is it in Utah? Coming up on yeah, 11 a.m., so we probably have e. about Wayland, another hour before. Uh, Veterans Administration Medical Center before, in Salt Lake City. Um, they break for lunch. And, uh, anyway, it, it's a uh, multi-page document. I, I'm not going. It also has other dates, but I'm going to focus just on that date. And uh, it says ski accident yesterday with positive LOC. What is LOC? Loss of consciousness. Loss of consciousness. I know that one. And it states slight 
HA headache and today being more irritable and complains of right lateral rib pain that is worse with inspiration, denies neck pain. Did that inform your opinions? Yes. Okay. This is the basis of his expert opinion. That's what they're admitting now. That's why we're going through it. The basis of my expert opinion would be your subscription. That was a terrible segue. But if you're one of the 16,000 people watching, I know not all of you are subscribed. So if you would like to help us on the road to 710,000, go ahead and subscribe. Before we get on to the rib, um, rib uh, I'm guessing lunch is around noon. Uh, they'll come later. Um, tell us what your opinions about the concussion. This feels like he's that, trying to figure uh, out what questions he's going to ask. On February 26, while 2016. He is standing Did there. Terry suffer one. Like, it's just. Yes. We, I don't think there's any dispute among providers. Um, he suffered a concussion. Were present. Uh, Terry's own testimony. Who caused uh, the accident is the question. He, he has had a, a concussion. Lost consciousness. Uh, he had a significant head injury. He struck the ground, and uh, even though he was helmeted, he was unconscious for a period of time. It's been described variably in the record from two minutes to 40 minutes, but it seems like it was, you know, several minutes duration. If he was unconscious face down in the snow LSC for several minutes, how did no one call ski patrol? Uh, it, it's, it's one it's of the predictive markers of, some, of a concussion that's more serious. So loss of consciousness means that the person is not aware and not, not, not functioning in their surroundings. Now, uh, you've read the report or the uh, testimony of Craig Ramon, the witness at the collision site, correct? It's a witness from yesterday. I have read his deposition. Okay, he testified yesterday. Hi. Uh, and I'll represent that I don't think it was in conflict with his deposition. But, um, what you think doesn't matter. What opinions do you have about the cause of this TB uh, concussion that Terry suffered? Um, that day, February 26th. He had an accident on the ski slopes? Well, uh, I mean, the, the cause of the concussion was a collision. He, he was, uh, I don't collision. think there's any question a collision occurred. Both witnesses from uh, the ski school and uh, Terry and Terry's friends describe a significant collision. There's an argument about who caused what, but that's, that's why we're here to be discussed later. But there was a collision. Um, in my opinion, the collision involved Terry at some point striking a hard enough object to break his ribs and to like the ground create a, a brain injury. Um, and I my think ambition the only didn't break her leg. There, it was simply the angle at which she hit the ground. For that would be either a, a direct, you know, helmet to the head, which did not occur, or striking the ground. And uh, so it's my opinion that her, that uh, Terry's concussion was caused by him striking the ground and and hitting his head. Uh, would striking the, the force of striking the ground, I'm going to skip ahead to the rib injury, would striking the ground increase if he had someone on his back? Well, I think that the force of injury, I'm just falling over, um, would not I don't be know if the these lawyers same are on force as if they you may have be. someone but they're seeking lawyers striking fees, so they you may not and, be. and knocking you over. If you have the combined mass of two people, uh, that would also increase the force on that. So, yeah, I, th I think that the combination of those things probably increased his his likelihood for injury. Yes, Chad. It was a With, bring it uh, on reference. Terry Sanderson's. Uh, I can do most of the opening and uh, rib injuries. Also, I'll inform you. you about how severe the impact was. Unless this gets. More yeah, so on his chest x-ray, which I'm not sure if you've shown the jury, but um, and I, I did bring a computer so I can bring those up if you would like, but he had four 
displaced rib fractures. So uh, they were on the lateral side, on his right side, um, and um, Terry was 69 at the time, male, had He is a radiologist, so he can talk about the broken density, ribs. So certainly not. That's helpful to elderly, know. Elderly, elderly, or uh, normal osteoporotic. Bone, normal bone and density. And in order to break, essentially snap four ribs, uh, would require a substantial amount of force. Okay. Your Honor, I'd like to uh, admit plaintiff's exhibit 30, the chest x-ray. They do have x-rays of his broken ribs. I think we're going to see those now. Plaintiff's exhibit 30 is received. Maybe or maybe not. I'm going to answer some questions as they're doing Dr. this. Dr. Gibby, are these uh, chest x-rays uh, that you reviewed? Krista said, can they force them to turn over the GoPro footage? Uh, it does yes, not exist but these any are longer. That's really a big question. Low resolution, poor copies, so I'm not sure what you're trying to show here. I'm these are bad. I'm you that these are the chest x-rays you reviewed at one the time. The resolution is terrible. And, um, uh, we understand x-ray experts like yourself, radiologists like to have the pure images, but this yes. is mostly to refresh your memory of what you reviewed. Yeah, but you cropped off where the <laughs> fractures are located on the right <laughs> side there. Are they, do you see them there? No. Okay. Them there. <laughs> when the doctors and the lawyers get annoyed with each other, it's like he has four broken ribs. I can, ribs, I can plug my computer in and let you see it no, directly. No, you can't. Yeah. No, you can't. Okay. That's not evidence. Oh, my goodness. You've cropped it so that we can't. Short recess. Ugh. No. Oh, George, I'm sorry. All right, go on. I've annoyed the floof. My floof is annoyed. My floof. Mr. Bueller, your voice is a little quiet at times. Maybe you could Bueller. just direct this a little closer to you. <laughs> yes, it was. Yep. Should I use that, Your Yeah, your, your choice, either. All right, thank you. All right, the court is on a brief recess while they figure out their evidence. And while they're on a brief recess, we are going to answer some questions because that's what we do. I also got, as I mentioned earlier, the law nerds have sent me two new sound makers. So not only do we have a pickle in, a screaming goat, do we need to pickle in? For those of you that are new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe, first of all. But second of all, do we need to pickle in? I think we need to pickle in to the break. I think we do. Everybody, it's time to stretch. It's a pickle stretch. All right, we've pickled into the stretch break. We've stretched. We're going to answer some questions while they figure out their evidence. Here's the problem with the evidence. Um, they cropped the x-rays, and they cropped out the lower ribs, which are the ones that appear to be broken. So when you crop out the broken ribs, that's real annoying. With 4,000 votes, you guys said you want me to post yesterday's coverage to its own video, so I'll put that up on the channel um, later today. Let's go to questions. Questions. Can the jurors take notes? I don't know yet. I have not heard whether they, excuse me, are or aren't taking notes. Delilah said, did she hit him on the head or push him down? We don't know. The facts in controversy in this case are who caused the collision. This was a ski collision, and they both went down in a ski collision. Who caused the collision is the facts in controversy here in this case. We don't know. I don't, for me, I don't have a sense of how this collision happened at all. I have no sense from opening statements. I'm very curious about this missing GoPro footage. The opening statements showed that there was an email from the plaintiff to one of the plaintiff's children that said it's all, or the child to the plaintiff saying, oh, it's good, it's all on GoPro or something of that effect. And the GoPro footage is nowhere. So 
the allegation, I think, from the defense is going to be, hey, you, um, if you're not at fault, where's the video then? If there was GoPro footage, which is not uncommon that somebody would be wearing a camera while skiing, if there's a GoPro footage of it, then then what is it? Angie asked, isn't skiing at your own risk? Well, skiing like driving has rules of the road and the rules of the slopes in Utah that are rules, like codified rules. Yes, they're kind of guidelines, but they're also codified rules. People ahead of you have the right of way. It is your responsibility to avoid them. That is part of the codified rules in Utah. So when we're talking about negligence, let's just talk about it a little bit more for everybody who's joined this afternoon. Let's talk about negligence, uh, cat glitter, which is the heart of this case. Should we, oh wait, let's lippy real quick while we talk about negligence, shall we? I didn't know they were gonna take a break. I could have done that before if I had been given a heads up, but they don't consider my schedule. I'm being facetious. This is a case because of the defendant's greed. No, I'm teasing. This is a case about negligence. Gwyneth Paltrow and Tellery Sanderson are suing each other for negligence. The amount of damages they're seeking are wildly different. The stories they have told about what went down are wildly different. But with negligence, you need a duty. Duty. I'm going to say duty a lot. A duty. Did they owe each other a duty of care? And that's where the rules come in in Utah. The duty of care is the people ahead of you have the right of way. It's your responsibility to avoid them. So if you're on the ski slopes together, you owe a duty of care to the other, the other, you know, snow adventurers on the slopes. Breach of that duty. Did somebody do something to breach the duty? Somebody collided into somebody, so they failed in their responsibility to avoid them. Cause and fact, did that Breach of duty caused the injury, caused the problem. Then are there damages? What kind of damages? Was there a loss? What loss was suffered? Those are the factors of negligence that we're dealing with. The duty is established by the rules of the slope in Utah. And then we've got to get to comparative negligence. These jury instructions are going to be a little bit more complex than some others because in Utah with your uh, comparative negligence, you've got to look at, was somebody 50% or more at fault? So, well, more than 50% at fault. If you're 50% at fault, you cannot recover. So if the jury says they collided to each other, they both collided, everybody's, everybody's equal, they both are comparatively negligent, nobody recovers. And it's a wash. If they find this is 50-50 liability, it's a wash and everybody walks away with nothing. So somebody has to be more at fault. Did Dr. Sanderson create this collision by 53% at fault or Gwyneth Paltrow 53% at fault? What I noticed when I was watching back the podcast, The Emily Show, if you haven't checked it out, it's up on the channel today. It's also up on your audio app. I was going through the complaint and Gwyneth Paltrow in their complaint alleged that they could not hear doc uh dr sanderson coming up behind them but then an opening statement we saw this allegation that not only did sanderson come up behind gwyneth paltrow but was like body to body with her and then started groaning well which is it did she hear him or did she not hear him that's my question i've got i've got questions i've got questions these attorneys do not make <laughs> feel like i will miss something at 2x you won't 2X is so helpful. 2X is so helpful. How do lawyers like this win cases? It just depends on who they're up against and the facts that they have. It depends on their facts. The facts here are difficult. The facts here are, are, are not clear. Um, Lori said they did call ski patrol, but not till much later based on the version of events that we've heard so far. Based on the version of events that we've heard so far, ski patrol was called not by the ski instructors, but by the friends. If this dude was face down on the slopes unconscious for five minutes, I would have thought that fact pattern would have played out differently. So they did not call ski patrol until he was already skiing back down the slope much later after it. So we'll see. Um, it can be both, said Joe J, but it's not in the complaint anywhere. So where did it come from between 2019 
and 2023? That's my question. It's it's interesting. All right, let us continue. Molly W shared as someone who is disabled due to a TBI, they can be different day to day and sometimes hour by hour, there is no normal. And I think when we're looking at comparative analysis, they're going to have to look at some comparative analysis, but this is also why the expert is relying on conversations with the people who knew the plaintiff before the injury. What was the plaintiff's normal or, or regular before and what is the plaintiff's regular after. And so it's looking at that difference in before and after. It looks like the judge just came out to take the bench. Yesterday, the plaintiff's lawyer mentioned that Paltrow might have had front of the line perk, said Anthony, wouldn't that make her in front of him? Just a thought, no. Paltrow had ski instructors with her. When you're with a ski instructor, um, they get front of the line on ski lifts so you're not waiting to get access to the slopes while you're during the time that you're paying for an instructor is what it seems to be but they were not in line for the lifts they were already on the slopes and because they were already on the slopes of where they were on the slopes matters who was furthest down the hill on the slope is what matters so not the front of the line perk doesn't play into that um here for years you need to try tim horton's coffee um this is for your canada travel plans fund we i need to get back to canada it's been too long um, JP said, my fur babies are all Harry Potter references to cats, rolling creature, and the grim plus a corgi named Neville Longbottom. My, f- my first cat, my beloved 17 year old cat when she passed was named Albus and I adored her. Uh, Lola PR said, I have a question. Is that Dame Maggie Smith in the back? I have no idea. Um, Rose said at 69 years and being a vet Medicare and supplement, he should have no concern of cost. I don't know what he's had to pay for and what he hasn't. Deb said, I'm a bit triggered here. Lifelong equestrian that has had three concussions and at least a dozen broken bones, including five ribs and one fall. Ouch. If anyone but me were responsible, I'd be furious. And that's completely fair, Deb. It is. Yeah, brain injuries are really, really tough. So um, Beth D said her attorney made the collision sound sexual in his opening. It was weird. It was weird. I was like, what in the fuck? I think that's actually what I said. I think I paused the opening and was like, what is happening? But we had some context to that in the motions in limine. Let me pull those up. The court's not back in yet. Let me pull up the rulings on the motions in limine. I talk about this in, uh, let's see, if I keep the audio on, I should be able to hear when they come back in. Let's pull these up and look at them together. Oh, that didn't work the way I intended it to. Give me one second. All right. Let's take a look at these. Where is it? Come back. Uh, come back, motions in limine. There was one that I was confused about a little bit. I'm going to just pull through these motions in limine real fast to get to the one I was looking for. Um, That's not it. That's not it. Hmm. Let's see, those are pre-existing medical conditions. This is demonstratives. This is, I forget which number it was. Um, I think it was in Paltrow's motions. Let's see. I'm going to try to find it real quick, even though we took care of it in the, um, in the, podcast yesterday. So bear with me one moment while I look for the reference I'm trying to find because it is mentioned in here and it was a confusing motion in limine. That's the I am famous statement. That's the, that's the deposition. That's the pretrial order cross-examination on the scope. That is the, uh, Exclusion of medical uh, records. I hear the court. <coughs> uh, so the attorneys Exhibit are talking. 32. I will and keep looking for this in a separate window which is a better and find it and let you guys know. X-rays. The one I had was... Uh, <coughs> oh, this is going to be a problem. The rib image, which is 31, but we definitely object to 32, which is that 2009 MRI. You object to him... Uh, 
to Dr. Gibby, but how about as an exhibit, do you object to it being entered into as an exhibit? I at this time. Dr. Gibby offering opinions about it, but he didn't offer at his deposition. Well, this that. came up how about just earlier. Exhibit? Oh, just admitting it? Um, yes, at this time. Well, we don't want him talking about it. I that. Yeah, I think, I think this is actually from us, Your Honor, so we would not object so to, exhibits, to the exhibit plaintiff's exhibits itself. 31 and 32 I received. Um, as to whether the witness can testify regarding 32, do you have do you have record of him? Have, I mean, can this witness I can you can you have this witness identify whether he reviewed it prior to his deposition? Oh, are they bringing in the jury while the attorneys are talking? Could counsel please approach as soon as the jury comes in? Ah, uh, that's that's how they're going to handle it. So the jury is coming in. The jury has been brought in while the attorneys were in the middle of making a record yet again about this. Thank you. And they're approaching for that. I'm continuing to look for the motion in limine that was regarding whether there were any past allegations of sexual harassment and things like that. I was confused as to why that would even be mentioned in a motion in limine with regard to a ski collision. And then we heard opening and I went, oh, that's interesting. So I'm not sure what we will see with regard to that or if there will be questions about that. I don't. I truly don't know. But we will see. Unfortunately, the document is scanned so that I cannot control effort, so I will have to find it later. I always hear motions in lemonade. I know. We try to make lemons. We try to make lemonade out of lemons. That's not true. I often try to make lavender lemon lemon drops out of lemons. <laughs> We're making lavender lemon drops out of lemons. I believe it was a motion in the plain. It was in the motions in lemonade. I just haven't found exactly where in the motions in lemonade it was. I think it's in the plaintiff's part two. It's just that there's quite a lot of them to go through when I can't search it. And I just don't remember exactly where it was. So I'll find it at some point and we'll talk about it. Um, Sunny Cat Mom said the ribs are not the big thing for me. My grandma broke ribs after choking and receiving the Heimlich. Well, the Heimlich can break ribs in, in people of any age. The broken ribs show the force of the fall, and the doctor said he had normal bone density and things like that. So the radiologist is going to testify about the type of force required and the fact that the bone density here was normal. That's a lot of lawyers up there. All Now all the lawyers are talking about it, and for the jury, this has to be... Um, They've, they've been delayed quite a bit this morning. The jury had to wait an hour from the time they were told to come in. And they had to, like, you know, over the river and through the woods through a storm this morning to get to court in the first place. Thank you for your patience. I did see that yesterday, Beth. I saw, I saw that yesterday. Are we getting back to questioning? I hope so. <sighs> okay. Uh, Dr. Gibby, I have a better photograph or version of the um, chest x-ray. I'd just like to show that you, to you briefly so we can see it. This is uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 31. Okay. It's been received. Are you going to put it up? <clears throat> there were definitely things stylistically okay. in Murdaugh that were a problem, but what Murdaugh is, uh, the importance of this generally moved pretty quickly. Giving. This is a definitely a uh, different This was an x-ray taken a different the day piece. after his incident um, showing uh, it's a series of images of his ribs. And I think the importance of this is documenting the trauma that he sustained. Okay. And can I describe that to the jury? Yes, please. Yeah, he should have asked you that, but okay. We lost the image. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll put it back up. I thought we were done. Is it okay if I go point out? Yeah, would you like the pointer, the yeah. laser? Oh, not the laser pointer, the ponards. The ponards will go nuts. I'm teasing. <sighs> Trial. 
Creighton did move too quickly at times. He did move very quickly at times. I was like, ah! Sure. Okay, we can hear you. Great. So This is why we're only doing parts of this trial. We can't do it. We can't do this all day, every day. Right on an x ray because they are dense and they're made of calcium. And you can see here where the rib is disrupted. There's a fracture. Here. Oh, there's a little green arrows. There's one here. There's one uh, here. That's so very hard to see for us. I hope it's there. easier for the jury. So there's a total of four fractured ribs along the lateral side of his right chest and it's over a substantial area uh, a good seven or eight inches across his chest but I just wanted you to see that these are uh, they're not so these fractures are displaced and uh, they will appear to reverse okay I mean, I don't doubt that he has broken ribs. I don't. It's just who caused. So. Uh, I know they have to prove damages, but. Dr. Gibby. Who caused it? The uh, concussion and the uh, broken ribs. What opinions do you draw about. That he uh, fell? the uh, extent of Terry Sanderson's injuries? Well, I don't think it was, you know, just a minor bump. He had enough force to knock him unconscious, uh, enough force to have persisting cranial symptoms that are documented in the record, and enough force to break four of the ribs on the right side of his chest. And, um, that, along with the deceleration of uh, uh, striking the ground, I think was, I mean, I, th I think that the rib fractures certainly corroborate that there was enough force to cause a head injury. And of course, he was complaining of the rib pain immediately after the accident and subsequently had this evaluated by um, the- Medical professionals? Uh, Instacare, and then I think he went to the Veterans Hospital probably because he was a vet and had the ability to get uh, free care there the next day. Okay. Um, I think you answered my next question. Uh, uh, what injuries did this? He was wearing a helmet. Cause? That's a good question, Melody. Are, are but he there, was is wearing there a anything helmet. Anything else that you can comment on that form your or that are the basis of your opinion, or give the jury your opinion? Um, well, I think those are the ones that are described in the record. He does have some abnormalities on his spine, uh, both in, in the cervical area, but I don't think those have been addressed in, uh, by the patient or in, in, in the court as, as part of this process. So the two primary complaints he had were the chest injury, which uh, healed over a period of months. Rib fractures can be very, very painful. They uh, it's, suck. Rib fractures suck. And, and I've bruised cases, my ribs and it sucks. Um, they will go in and plate the ribs back together in order to reduce the risk of lung puncture <coughs> and to help people heal quicker. We also do some pain management techniques with this where we will inject um, cortisone and numbing medicine around the broken ribs. But as you can imagine, every time someone takes a breath, that fracture is moving. Um, unlike, say, a long bone, you can't really cast the chest. You can't immobilize it. So it does you take have a to breathe. Of time for these to heal. And, and again, it uh, makes it difficult. The coughing to, to is one of the plaintiff's counsels. It just is. Um, do the rib fractures um, <coughs> indicate that uh, Dr. Sanderson or Terry Sanderson was hit from the rear and from the side? And why? That's leading. 
So I think that's, you know, one of the... I'm shocked there's no objection the, to that, but okay. ...questions of this case. Um, <coughs> it doesn't seem to be any dispute that there was a collision. True. Um, it does... I agree. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any dispute that there were injuries. Uh, Dr. Sanderson experienced enough trauma to break ribs and cause a concussion. Um, then the question is, was this something that... Oh, that's me. ...he caused or the defendant Sorry. caused? And based upon my analysis of the x-rays and the reports from uh, witness, the witness, Craig, who was there, I think it's very unlikely that this would have been Rhonda, caused that's what yesterday's testimony showed. by Terry running into uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, first of all, when you're skiing, your knees would be bent, your arms would... Maybe we should approach for this one. Sure. Oh, boy. All right. Well, they approach off the record. I'm going to read the uh, motion and eliminate because I finally found the part because um, I overlooked it twice, apparently, because me. Um, motion to exclude any reference to or insinuations based on irrelevant, excuse me, evidence. And it said the plaintiff's motion seeks to preclude evidence of plaintiff's business dealings, unlawful acts, unfounded, alleged sexual harassment or unsavory behavior. The court has ruled that as a threshold manner, the plaintiff's motion lacks specificity regarding the alleged prior bad acts, which the plaintiff is seeking to exclude. So we will see if these prior bad acts come up, if there are any, what they are going to ask particular witnesses about. But that is there. The plaintiff wanted it not to be brought up. They must have known the defense was going to talk about this groaning in some way. Remember, they've all done depositions. They've heard what most of the witnesses are going to say, and it's going to be pretty consistent. So um, in the chat, it was just asked, is Athena, is Terry some random guy or someone Gwen knows personally? Some random guy. They're both randoms to each other. Um, they were just all at Deer Valley the same day. She stopped skiing that day. Did he, he, her stop or continue? They both stopped skiing that day. He, I don't know when he sought medical. It wasn't really clear to me yesterday if he sought medical treatment that night or the next day, but they both stopped skiing for the day, if that helps. Um, but he took her down from behind and she clearly fell on the side and backwards, typical ski fall on top of him. She didn't fall forward on her face. We don't know that she says he took he hit her from behind he says she hit him from behind and that he was left face down in the Dr. snow Gibby, what's your opinion as to how this crash these injuries were caused so there's I, going I to based be based on the uh stated testimony of of the defendant of craig ramon who was the only eyewitness and based upon the pattern of injuries that are present here um what I believe happened is that he was struck from the left side and that uh, forced Thank you, Lady him Kirkpatrick. into the ground. It's, it's also been the testimony here that uh, Ms. Paltrow was on top of him at some point. So the combined weight of the two individuals slamming into the ground caused the fracture and the head injury. And I don't think it would be plausible that if he were running into her, that he would have broken the ribs on the side of his chest. He likely would have Unless had his arms extended. Unless he landed on her and he then would have fell protected to the side. Himself. He would have had knees, arms, etc., in front of his chest. And so, um, Unless he, he fell might to the have ground had and other then injuries. Fell off. He could have broken a leg or an arm or a wrist or something like that. But, but in terms of a frontal collision, had he. He's a radiologist. Uh, into Ms. Paltrow. I don't think he would have had these types of injuries. So he is an expert and, in radiology. Um, and I also think, you know, just given the differential and mass of the people involved, uh, I think differential and uh, mass she is would like have broken his way to say it. fall, so to speak, reduced his his collision velocity and in, in the impact, and probably it's a good point. If, she would have been a buffer. Been the person running into her, I don't think he would have sustained these types of injuries. Katie, she says he landed on her first, on her back. He says she landed on him. Uh, does your so expertise uh, allow you to make these conclusions like you do? 
Oh, look, a direct question. Um, yes. <laughs> a direct answer. Now I'd like to talk about the uh, uh, head injury again. We went through the ribs. We'll go back and forth. Oh, we're going to see accident uh, reconstructionist. You've uh, examined Terry Sanderson, and it was about five years after the crash, correct? Correct. I think they're going to argue that age card. jury Kirk? about uh, how persistent his injuries are and whether they're Because it would have been hard. Permanent. Her helmet would have been hard, right? Well, I, I think the record is fairly uh, replete with examples of where Terry has continued to suffer from uh, some, some neurologic deficits, both in his ability to focus his ability to perform tasks, uh, his, his memory, uh, and especially his interpersonal relationships, emotional ability, and anger Sunshine, management. Sunshine, both of and, these parties, of things, which both Terry of these parties will testify issues prior to the accident. So, I do think his his symptoms have been uh, persistent. There is some ever, evidence in the record from his daughter that some of these things had gotten uh, a bit better, that he had improved, but he wasn't back to normal. Uh, will he ever get back to normal and why? Both of these were more experienced skiers you know, I, on a more I, beginning I, run I that seemed to be a little um, bit steep. The human brain has some plasticity to it, but as we get older, our ability to reform neural connections and to uh, Wild bout. diminishes his ribs are cracked the time. on the side towards and, the back. Um, typically, if a person has not uh, he's a radiologist. regained that function, he's a neuro radiologist. Lost capacity within about twelve to eighteen months, they're probably not going to get it back. Elaine, how come she doesn't have any injuries if he ran into her? She said she was sore for uh, the day. Why wasn't Ms. Paltrow so we'll see. Uh, hurt significantly in this collision? That's the question right there that y'all have been asking. Well, I, I don't it's his opinion. know that I have an answer to that. I, you know, uh, Ms. Paltrow, first of all, the record, ah! she was hurt. She was stiff and sore after the accident at lunch. Uh, at least that's what the ski instructor reported. Um, She's much younger than Terry, and therefore probably more capable of that type of she collision. Has, she has jade but, vagina eggs. Um, I, I, I don't want to speculate. I mean, she could have been injured, Young, yes. Younger is, I think, the big factor here, right? Because you can be, soft tissue injuries suck. I'd, I'd like to... Uh refer you to the defense experts. You reviewed their reports, correct? I did. And um, I wonder how much the, plaintiff uh, not being present in court a lot is going to factor in uh, here. Like if Gwyneth Paltrow uh, can sit through court, Gibby, where is he? Me, doctors uh, Black, Edgley, and Hesh. Um, uh, how do you differ or what, what is your response to their opinions in this case? Well, you'd probably have to refresh my memory on some of their opinions because that's a fairly blanket statement. But I, I, I can recall to cross examination if we ever get there. Dr. Black, he had refute, uh, reviewed the imaging and suggested that there was uh, evidence of uh, multi uh, infarct white matter disease and there was atrophy of the brain. I don't think in Terry's case there's much atrophy. His cortical gyri, the, the cortex itself is still uh, very well preserved for his age. What he has is dilatation of his ventricles. So at least what? the inner part of the brain looks, the, the, the fluid pathways are dilated, but I don't think he has significant brain atrophy as you might see in someone with dementia or multiple strokes or longstanding uh, injuries. So in that respect, I would uh, disagree with Dr. Black. I do, I do think that Dr. Black uh, discussed the, um, the diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus, and I'd like to just say that is a clinical diagnosis, and uh, Terry Sanders did not have any of the Amanda, that's what clinical his attorney symptoms said. I agree associated with, with 
That's what his normal his pressure was. hydrocephalus. He had radiologic findings of dilated ventricles, but he had not progressed. He had a compensated hydrocephalus, essentially. Uh, but many people have dilated ventricles, and they do just fine. That's what, what they're here to figure um, out. What he clearly did not have like were the classic accident. symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus, Oops. such as Nightbot having its problems with his gait, moment. ataxia, for example. If someone is ataxic, they're probably not going to be skiing. Uh, he and did he not did have symptoms of dementia. He was a very bright, active, engaged person. He did not have difficulty with urinary incontinence or, you know, urinary problems. So. The typical symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is usually diagnosed later, I think it was just serendipity that, that these images found the, these dilated ventricles. But in Terry's case, I don't think they were causing symptoms, and uh, I don't think they're the primary cause of his current symptoms. Ah, user error. Curricular dilatation had been present for at least a decade. They were seen on a CT scan and he kept uh, skiing at the for Veterans that Hospital a decade earlier, and they had been stable for a long period of time. This is supposed to be an eight-day trial. Can you being a risk factor for uh, persistent uh, post-concussive I haven't heard symptoms. anything about cameras on the ski trail. I don't know. Well, I think in this case, you know, some of the risk factors for He's a very having skier. persistent problems with concussion. One of the risk factors he's is that he's not in the courtroom right now. Trauma. They we keep know that flashing the council table, and he's not been and there. Athletes. Another risk factor they told is the jury age. about that. As you get older, your brain has a harder time adjusting. But I think in Terry's case, he had this condition where his his fluid spaces, these the lateral and third ventricles, were dilated. And as a result, the fibers that connect the halves of the brain together are stretched over this structure. Water is not a very compressible substance. Uh, if you put a shock wave into water, like you know, you drop a depth charge in a submarine, that force Ooh, like you is violently one. transmitted to Sorry, the submarine. Sorry, I like submarine. that movie. Yeah, and in the case of Terry, he had this, these fluid spaces that were enlarged in the inner inside of his brain, and uh, his fiber connections, his white matter was already somewhat stretched. It was already, you know, at risk, and that shock or that rapid deceleration injury um, likely was exacerbated by the presence of this underlying U571's is one of the first movies I ever owned on DVD. So are the problems Terry's experiencing now with uh, uh, his persistent concussive symptoms, how was that, uh, or was that caused by I wonder if the dude with the beard is Gwyneth Paltrow's security officer. We'll have to keep an eye on whether he, the one who's sitting here like this, I mean, I wonder if in terms of trying to figure out causation, you have to look at um, what happened before and what happened after. Bef uh, immediately before the event, Terry was in a stable, committed relationship with a with a person. Yeah, this matters very he much. The personality had a changes. Great relationship with his daughters and his grandchildren. He had many friends. He was very sociable. His life completely changed uh, after this accounts, collision, a whoever caused it. Various sort of outgoing person. Um, this event happens and he has a very abrupt change of personality, of his functioning. And so and that's I don't think part. you can claim that the slow, well, actually very stable, you know, over the decade previous with his normal pressure hydrocephalus, okay, so beard whatever guy that is was, security. Thank uh, you all. did not cause his abrupt change in symptoms post accident. Now, we all age, we all uh, get symptoms over time, and, uh, you know, could the normal pressure hydrocephalus affect him at some point in his life? Absolutely. Not uh, weird at all. But so could other, other problems related to aging. I want us to get to cross-examination. Okay. Uh, Please. Dr. 
Stephen Edgley, medical cross, doctor, cross, cross. indicates in his report that um, uh, none of plaintiff's medical records support his claims that per perceived symptoms of cognitive decline are related to the ski collision. How do you respond to the defense's expert mm. on that? Well, obviously, the Tammy, defense I would say expert has a good medical info is often not very no, exciting. Um, it's interesting. It's just not he's fiery. paid to give a certain storyline. The uh, I think the record is very clear. This is that just a very real trial. Changes in his behavior, in his interpersonal relationships, and uh, in his functioning. So. I'm not sure how this doctor could claim that there were no symptoms related to the accident. Um, um, so yeah, I, I, I think I, just, I think that's yeah, yeah. wishful thinking. Bon Jovi was an E five seven one chat. Y'all are so wise. Uh, Doctor Robert Hesch, spelled H O E S C H, indicates Thank that Terry's uh, neurological persisting neurological conditions or symptoms. I like this type of linear uh, that he reports questioning. since the ski crash are likely attributable to pre-existing health conditions. How do you respond to Dr. Hesh? I like the going through the defense. They're going through the defense experts and well, responding again, to them um, without doing it on the bottle, which I appreciate. Those pre -existing because they can, because these are all the locked accident. in opinions uh, from deposition. There are some things in the medical record. He had a, an embolic event to his right eye, so he lost most of the vision in his eye. So he did have some visual uh, changes. He had some age-related hearing loss, which in the medical record was described as mild. He was using hearing aids, not uncommon at that age. The other he had a history of high blood pressure, in. although they're not in evidence yet. Um, it had been well controlled. He was on blood pressure medication. I think that the imaging that I did and that others have done on his brain over the last decade have not shown the sequela of the uh you know uh, that somehow hypertension was causing uh, brain problems he does not have multiple tiny white matter infarcts in the location that you typically see with hypertensive disease he has some white matter disease around the corpus callosum where these stretched ventricles are but hypertensive white matter disease usually occurs where there are little small end vessels kind of at the zones where the there isn't great blood supply to the white matter so deep white matter places like the thalamostriate arteries and the basal ganglia the pond okay we're in the weeds brain structures and Darn it. none we, of that he has the no deep white matter got us into the weeds in those, in those areas that are typical for hypertensive related mm. uh brain injury or white matter disease. He has no cortical I know you're infarcts. a professor and we appreciate you, but you need to strokes. make it human when we get um, that that deep into the weeds. Uh, you we know, need to he make had a few human. other conditions. He had a laminectomy on his back, which I think is completely unrelated. He had had some arthritis in a finger uh, and a thumb. Um, so yeah, he, he, Terry uh, Sanders had some medical issues and medical complaints there's no question about it but i don't think we can blame his current um medical conditions on just pre-existing conditions okay so a neuropsychologist uh, <coughs> angela eastfold also has opinions about terry um, she confirms that he had a mild uh, concussion, but then goes on to say uh, that the course and evolution of his self-reported symptoms are inconsistent with the known trajectory of concussive-related symptoms. Sparky Palico, I love that you're uh, like this Dr. is my Eastfold. this is my jam, and thank you for the important work that you do. Well, Only one I person on the her. jury is a nurse. Terry had a concussion. Uh, I think we can agree that much. Um, so it's hard if you don't bring it down so everybody can understand. It makes it hard to stay engaged too when you don't understand. It's like, okay. Um, a concussive patients is, it is typically to recover. So yes, in that, in that regard, he did not follow the normal trajectory. But 
Cross this exam- is not I don't think we're going to get to cross examination before lunch, that, and uh, I've got interviews. He has continued to suffer, and T Bird. He had an abrupt change in his uh, activities and in his functioning. So, um, you know, I guess people can disagree politely. T Bird, how is this not hearsay? He's an expert. Um, He's allowed to rely on hearsay in forming his opinion that, uh, and respond to it. So it's not being offered for the truth. Pre existing conditions. So it's an exception to hearsay. Uh, NPH or sore finger or. Uh, Copper Ridge, the dude uh, with the beard is your cousin. Uh, he is a talent manager. He looks like he could be a bodyguard. depression. And it looks like he has a killer tattoo Did sleeve. Does that contribute to why he has this long sleeve? Does he, in fact, have that a killer tattoo sleeve? I've got questions. That are evident now. No, but I think you make a also, point there. I mean, he had sitting been through trial like this is above and beyond the duties of a talent depression. manager. Um, this must be so, so he boring. He was on medication for that. Depression is a pretty common diagnosis in modern society, um, but it seems that his condition worsened following this event. Uh, so yes, I think the depression was a pre-existing condition that. It might be conflated with some of his current Stina symptoms, G, very but point. certainly not all of those, uh, not all of his symptoms. Uh, well, again, what is the primary cause of his current conditions with uh, PCS, persistent concussive symptoms? Or Thank you for explaining PCS, counsel. Is it the ski crash versus these other causes? That's the point of well, this testimony. Uh, what the is the cause? change in his functioning in his behavior and in his indicates um, his ability to interact with people indicates um, was not something brought on by his pre-existing conditions he had had those for many many years and had functioned well and was stable and so his NPH had been uh, stable for a decade and I, I I'm not even sure I should call it NPH. He had these dilated ventricles. He did not have a clinical diagnosis. Yes, this is an expert. So he evaluated Um, him much later, but he evaluated the records. It it, it was well managed with these other issues. And that's common practice. His hypertension was controlled. He wasn't having strokes. Um, So, yeah, I, I I don't see that we can pin his current problems on his, on the pre existing issues. And that's what the defense is going to try to do. You also uh, used an, or conducted an fMRI um, on Terry Sanderson. Can you explain what that was? We did. So fMRI is a, is a test where we look at the brain while the patient is doing certain tasks. So, it's, uh, so imaging has evolved over time. In the old, old days, we just took x-rays, and you could, couldn't even see inside the brain. And then we started injecting air into the ventricles to see if there was a shift and then CAT scans came along. But as as medicine has evolved, we've been able to image with much greater sensitivity and specificity. Um, So it's not surprising that his CT scan, which was taken the day after his accident, was So in 2016. He didn't show any evidence of acute trauma at that time. That's interesting. His MRI scans showed some small white matter lesions around the corpus callosum, which may have been related to some stretching injury or some type of um, injury at the time of the accident. But lots of people get white matter disease as you get older. That's sort of like wrinkles. Um, We performed a functional MRI where we had him do actual or more normal tests part of aging. in the scanner, so solving puzzles, having him normal, common do memory aging. tests, doing um, you know spatial recognition and and uh, things that require higher cortical function. And we we subjected Terry to seven different functional MRI tests, and uh, of those seven, one was abnormal, and that was the matrix reasoning test. And he was below two standard deviations compared to our normative controls on that test. And that is essentially uh, the matrix reasoning is a, is a puzzle solving uh, test where you're using lots of frontal lobe activity as well as your occipital areas that uh, are involved with visualizing images and uh, spatial recognition, et cetera. And 
Those I are think we'll hear the more frontal more and occipital areas are two common places plaintiff. that that and can be injured in a the traumatic witness at the end of the day yesterday process. explained the personality so changes and of the, the changes. I think the good news is that most of his imaging of looked yesterday. normal or within normal limits within the yardstick we have of the of the best uh, functional imaging today. Um, I, I think that the value of functional imaging is that we can actually watch patients while they are doing complex tasks. Which is pretty cool. Uh, something like a, an, an anatomic scan of the brain. People can have normal MRIs of the brain but be very abnormal. They can have schizophrenia or autism or severe depression or uh, bipolar disorder or you know all kinds of issues and the brain will look normal but it doesn't function normally so this is an attempt to move that boundary of, of uh, investigation of brain functioning and using MRI in a functional manner to assess if he could perform these complex operations and how he performed those compared to normative controls. Which and is interesting. He did have an abnormal uh, functional test on his matrix reasoning. I do that, I pop up in places. Uh, Terry Sanderson has high test scores in other areas by neurologists, neuropsychologists, medical doctors. Um, does that mean he, he doesn't have a brain injury and why? That's a good question. Well, lots of people, uh, there's variability in the population in terms of their function. Um, uh, Terry is a very bright individual, very capable, and, um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, he doesn't sustain an injury and move from really bright, really capable to just, you know, within the average or within normal. Uh, average. Because that's so, not average for him. Uh, I, right. I think that the best test, and we've we've had doctors provide evidence about you know brain scans. We've had neurologists testify, neuropsychologists. But really, the best test that we have for humans is how do they perform in a complex world? I think so. You think about it. Just how you you drove here to Park City on a snowy morning. That requires a lot more processing power than you know even the best computers that can do today. Um, so I think that the best the best test, the best challenge of Terry Sanderson is how how is he doing? How is he functioning in life? And I think there are a number of areas where he has had a fall off in his abilities. I agree with that, and I think that we saw that from the testimony. And I think One of that his that is recommend that, that after the this easy way crash, for the jury to understand after too. about 18 months that he try to do as many activities he did before, such as travel or um, his life changed. Be active like he was as much as he can. I don't but think that's maybe travel too much in controversy. So get lost. What is your opinion on those kinds of recommendations? The severity of his injury, the severity I mean, of the impact of his injuries, is a question. Many people have. It is injuries and they they try to overcome them through various activities I, I think probably the worst thing that he could do is to sit at home and be depressed and not uh, and, and not have those interactions so yes uh, I mean Terry was a self-described person who did a lot of travel before and I'm sure he did travel afterwards I, but I don't think that that is evidence that he is somehow you know, unimpaired that he's that he hasn't had any any symptoms related to this injury. Did you see any any evidence of malingering or faking, or he he was trying to exaggerate his injuries? Uh, no, I I didn't. Um, uh, the functional MRI I think is difficult to fake because you have to, it's the it's scanner is actually your washing works. your brain as you right. process this data, and you'd have to be pretty pretty smart to try to fake if you would the, I don't even know if you the MRI could scan do in that. terms of how the blood is flowing and where the brain is activating uh, usually when we see someone who is faking or not trying then many of the tests are screwed up you know they're just 
uh, it doesn't make sense, but all of his tests except one were within normal range. And I think he certainly was trying. Uh, we didn't mention, I don't think, in detail at least, uh, one neuropsychologist. Kathy, that's how the, the plaintiff is saying this happened for them. Um, that he Galit fell Eskenazi. with his arm against uh, his body, and that's how he broke his arm. Seems ribs. to that's think that saying. following the incident, Terry suffered from exacerbation of anxiety yeah, and depression. We don't know if there's muffins. Um, which returned to baseline in about mm, five months, but muffins. there's no evidence of any permanent mental Ooh, I have banana bread health changes. Mm. How would you respond to Dr. Eskenazi's? I'm not sure what data she used. Um, I think that today's running about an hour and a half behind what again, their anticipated the schedule was. Again, the record is fairly so replete. So that's going to be with, really interesting. Um, replete mean, meaning there's, there's lots of evidence in here, and in fact, his former what? partner, uh, girlfriend that he had during the time of the injury, uh, they separate. I don't think she has any any um, ulterior motive. I mean, at this point. They're not together. Why would she come forward and, and say he's having all of these problems? Why is he different? I, I don't think she has any incentive to do that. In fact, she would have the incentive to do the opposite. Um, so um, I, I think that the best evidence out there is the reports of the that people that know Terry best. When you're looking at these types of damages, it gives a lot um, of info. You've heard of the term eggshell uh, plaintiff? I have not. Okay. <laughs> Are you asking um, him to define legal terms? People being more sensitive to injury Objection. than others, correct? Oh, that's fair. That's a fair uh, question. I don't know if that's a term, but, but sure. Or the concept. You've heard of the concept. Sure. He's like, I'm and, not going to agree uh, to that. So it's possible that Terry was more sensitive to an injury such as what occurred on at Deer Valley in the ski crash than others. And that's a risk factor or, or something that may have caused him more injury than another person would have had. Does that make sense? And no. How do, you, how do you respond to that? Well, Why I would respond that Terry had a, he sustained a significant injury. <sighs> he was knocked out. He had four broken ribs. Yeah. So I don't know that that's an eggshell. That's, that's a pretty significant force. But that's um, not what they're saying. They're saying could the force have not been that significant whether or not, and he uh, be he particularly would have recovered vulnerable. Or recovered quickly. Um, there are lots of people that don't get better after a traumatic brain injury. Um, it, it, we typically see that from car accidents, but you know, some people just aren't right after an injury. And um, this is kind of like a car accident. I, th I think they Terry were, falls in that category. But we don't know what speed they were moving at. Okay. Uh, just a moment. Okay. They're going to see if they have any final questions. I imagine once they wrap up, this is going to go to no lunch. Questions. Thank you, Dr. Tweet. Thank you. That council is going to ask them to go to lunch. Pardon me? Can we go five minutes? Why don't you approach? The court's like, why the fuck do you want to go five minutes? Um, Linda Frazier, can they dismiss this case as BS? No. They've already been through those processes. Parts of this case have been thrown out. This is what is left of this case negligent claims from both parties. So no, they can't. And the facts are very much in dispute. Both parties' facts are in dispute. They really are. We've got uh, two parties saying that the other party caused an accident, and then we've got witnesses on both sides saying very different things. The witness yesterday said that Terry was hit from behind. The report from the ski instructors say that Gwyneth Paltrow was hit from behind. There are a lot of conflicts on this in this case so um i second the pixel being named the pickle being named ipsy dixit um if you haven't watched today's podcast that doesn't make sense to you but yes we might have to name the pickle ipsy dixit um would you consider reviewing and commentating on plaintiff's first witness testimony i was left speechless he was not helpful and might have perjured i can look at it i don't know if he perjured himself i watched it myself i think he was flustered and kind of evasive on cross-examination. But I can look back at it. I don't know if I'll do a summary of it, but I will keep it in mind. 
Um, Cat P said first super chat. Thank you. Thank you for all the coverage. You're welcome. I think we've been spoiled by the Depp v. Heard trial. Yep. The trials since have been so different and they're going to be. Every trial is going to be different. Every jurisdiction is going to be different. We are going to get different quirks every single time. Paige said, would we be here if she was Jane Doe? If she wasn't Gwyneth Paltrow, what would we be here? I don't think you get sued unless you're someone who's wealthy over this. I don't know. Mr. Egan, you may proceed. Why are they giving him five minutes? Are they trying to be done with him? Are they going to finish Cross in five minutes? All right, let's see what happens. Here we go. May I begin, Your Honor? You may. Dr. Gibby, good to see you again. Uh, I have a couple questions uh, before we break for lunch about uh, this comment that you made about Mr. Sanderson having a good relationship with his doctors. You read some of their testimony, is that correct? I did. Oh. And, uh, and do you recall reading wearing, this plaintiff uh, was about wearing a Jenny helmet. Sanderson, one of his daughters? Ooh, interesting. Um... <laughs> I, I I don't remember the names exactly, but I know you're saying it. Let's make it sure. quick, the and he's like, was, uh... I think the, the one that I recall reading was the oldest daughter that had a granddaughter that had just graduated from high school, and then there was another one that... Um, I, so there were only two two depositions of the two. Yeah. So maybe you can tell me the names and I will. Sure. Well, I'll just ask you things that okay. may, maybe sure. came up in some of the others. So Jenny, uh, the youngest, um, she testified that she did not feel loved or nurtured by her father growing up. Did you read about that? I, di I didn't read her deposition. Oh, uh, this. Because I did not see any of that. Uh, they didn't give you that and, deposition? And this may have been discussed in some of the other daughters' depositions, so I'll just keep reading in case you, you read, huh. uh, read about any of these other statements. Uh, there's also testimony that Mr. Sanderson was domineering and emotionally and verbally abusive to Jenny and uh, her mother, Tana. Here's you, the, you the estranged daughter. No, I, I do recall some testimony about uh, him being angry with the man that was uh, having an affair with his wife and that that was <laughs> oh, atypical shit. for him. I think he was, you know, punched him or something. But that was... Jennifer, what does this have to do with anything? Injuries. It has to do with whether or not okay, his what personality about, uh, changed and whether he had changes from this injury. About Mr. Sanderson becoming it frustrated if his expectations weren't met and this is referring to his children. So we'll talk about this again in a bit. Uh, no, I don't recall that. What about testimony that he has always been easily frustrated and quick to anger. Um, this feed does not have post caption. I think that contradicted by other testimony oh, by Fred, you daughter, scared me. But, uh, but no, I was not aware <laughs> of that testimony. Okay, what about testimony that his frustration was visible this in his body language and in the way he would softer talk? Softer on cross. No. Uh, like I said, I don't think I've His answers are, the volume is much lower. Um... What about testimony that he did not speak with one of his daughters, Jenny, for 13 years? Not aware of that. This is going to the um, opinion. What about testimony that Mr. Sanderson is controlling and relentlessly tries to mold Jenny to be a certain way? This is going to, did you consider these things yeah, in considering yeah, those who knew him? Any of the testimony from this Jenny. doctor okay. relied I, I not given that on message. those that knew Sanderson. Well, some some of these things may have been addressed by the daughters. Sure. As you mentioned with the, the this um, doctor relied on those affair. that knew there Sanderson. There may be something that's related, and I want to give you an opportunity to address it. Have you read any testimony right. that Mr. Sanderson was hyper focused on success and compares his uh, daughters uh, to that standard in a painful way? I did, read, I did read testimony about him being very focused, and uh, one of the terms was anal retentive, or anal or something like that, that he was, um, that he okay. was a very focused okay. individual and um, a multitasker, but not any, again, I've not heard any of the negative comments from this daughter, and, I, and I'm not she sure what that relationship wasn't. was, whether this was 
from a previous marriage or you know what happened there but okay. not aware of that okay what about testimony that this daughter Jenny has taken breaks from there her father there are three daughters the because he oversteps the boundaries she sets there are three daughters um again haven't read Jenny's testimony okay the fact that's that thanks. he that's the are, whole are cross. you resting or are you just resting for lunch oh, just for lunch okay. oh all right we'll take I a recess now well. for lunch and we'll return at 1 30. all right y'all court is going to resume in an hour and a half i will not be i have some interviews um that i'm doing i will check in with the trial as it progresses this afternoon if i decide to go live and you want to know about that and don't want to rely on YouTube telling you, you need to sign up for our email alert system, lawnardalert.com. That is a... Sure. He didn't excuse you, I guess we're what if... just unless there's anything that, that the lawyers need. All right. If we have something, anything like what we needed to do this morning... I wonder if the lawyers are going to be mad about that. There was an objection to testimony, and I'm, I guess I'm referring to the defendants mostly right now. If, if you could let the court know, so hopefully we could handle that in not in the jury time. We can come earlier in the morning. We can work over lunch. We yes. can do things after five. So that would be helpful. I'm so sorry, Your Honor. I missed the very first part of that. If, if you have any objections to testimony that may require, you know, examining the witness out of the hearing of the jury or substantial argument, uh, let's try to do that. Uh, I mean. For example, if you're preparing tonight and you all of a sudden realize you've got something, email the clerk. We can email the other lawyers and or email the other lawyers and the clerk, and we can come in at 8:30 if we need to. So. Yes, that's reasonable. I do foresee one issue, Your Honor. If the next witness is uh, Polly, who is one of the daughters, sure. That there are some issues uh, that I I do want. We'll to talk come about out, and one I don't of want leaving to get soon. a like a character. Um, objection but I also don't want to have a hearing before so you can't control uh, if they object or not for fuck's sake forewarning because that's I think the very next Ugh. witness your honor they're going to object next. if it's, a, if it's the subject of the motion in limine order is that what you're talking about where the court Just precise words like yeah I mean you said 607 okay 608 oh I want to hear before and there are some issues that uh, I think may impact both. Okay, well, and let me come back about 15 minutes early. You think that would be enough? Well, let me just ask, <laughs> Goldstein is next. Yeah, we don't want to keep him waiting. And we thought we'd be long done. Uh, so Paul and Dr. Gibby, so we're gonna uh, finish Dr. Gibby and then go to Dr. Goldstein. It sounds like there's some extensive cross-examination of Gibby. I don't know what extensive means, but are you asking if Dr. Goldsmith can begin at 1.30? No. Okay. Sure. Gibby than Goldsmith. All right. I'll just let me withdraw my statement right now. I'm just sort of say I can see some things with the I'm daughters. I'm just sort of going out. with okay. it, okay. Your okay. Honor. Okay. And back at 1:30. Back at 1:30. Thanks. How much cross do you have? Give me a. Mm, maybe I'm thinking an hour. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. It looks like Gibby and then Dr. Goldstein are the witnesses for this afternoon. Uh, um, my plan is to monitor this afternoon when I am done with interviews that I am doing. If I decide to go live, I will let you know on social media and at Lawnard Alert. If you are on Instagram and you follow me there and you would like to sign up for the alerts, those alerts come through where your DMs are. It's called a channel and I can keep you in the loop there too. You just need to go to my profile on Instagram. For those of you that are members, I will always put it in the members spaces. I will be on Up and Adam's channel a little bit later, taking a break from Paltrow and talking about the law, the reality shows, the bravo of it all. So I will be there. I know this is your favorite place to watch trials. I don't mean to abandon you for the afternoon. It is my intention to go live when court starts tomorrow instead of doing our normal 11 a.m. coffee and cursey words. So with that, we will see what tomorrow brings, and then we will see what happens for the rest of the week. If Gwyneth Paltrow testifies tomorrow, I don't know what my schedule looks like. I think I have an early morning 
for some uh, television appearances tomorrow, but I don't know what my afternoon looks like. If I can clear it, I will go all day tomorrow um, to, to just cover the trial for the day. So with all of that, I don't know how much we're going to miss today. We're going to miss a lot of um, medical testimony today that's going to be like this. With all of that, um, tomorrow night will be my stream with Dr. B for the patrons at Larners Unite. I will put that up. Um, I will put that up for all of y'all that are in the membership over there. I'm going to be trying to explain a little bit of this trial to Dr. B. He knows nothing about it. And I got a few new books from the law nerds that Dr. B has not seen. So I will be, we will be doing some of that and we will be doing a Q and a as well. Kind of an ask us anything together. We purchased a new yet untried 15 year whiskey that we will be trying together. So those always turn into ask a dentist. I know he's at school all day today, um, teaching. So that'll be fun. Is up and Adam members only? No, it's not. I'll share it in our chat so you guys can come over and join us. It's not members only. So with that, um, is this TV lawyer? What's about the, uh, oh, I did, uh, Sherry, I'm sorry. I didn't process that. Well, I'm going to get to questions. If you want to rephrase that, I'll grab it. Um, yes, please explain. I only just saw this trial. Today's podcast will help. I also have a quick bit out. What time am I on up and Adam? I am on at 315 Central. Uh, and then I've got an interview before that. And then I've got some, I was on court TV last night. I've got some stuff this morning and there will be summaries around of people covering it. If you want to watch the medical trial, I'm sure there will be places to cover it. Uh, I'm going to do some questions and then I'm not going to shout out other channels because I feel like it would be rude to up and Adam to go over on his channel and then tell you all to go watch the trial somewhere else <laughs> because that's just not, it, it, our chat is a unique chat so there are there are very few like us since Gwyneth Paltrow's team has mentioned dementia if a loved one suffers from any type of dementia please consider upon death donating brain to Harvard Brain Bank 100% free they pick up even if a holiday studying for dementia cures thank you Jilly Bear I did not know that was a thing but I always appreciate the generosity of knowledge with this group y'all are incredible y'all have been through some shit law nerds y'all are you all are you all are tough tough humans. And I think your generosity of sharing your experiences help us all learn more about each other because humaning is hard on the internet. And I think the law nerds do it better than anyone else. We get to human on the internet together in a community. Skiing is known dangerous, um, at your own risk sport. If this doctor was skiing, he should have been wearing a helmet. He was wearing a helmet. He is assuming the risk. Yes. And no, when not taking care of his own safety, shouldn't be a lawsuit. I twist, I respectfully disagree. He is assuming the risk that he might fall, that he might catch a ski on some ice. He is not assuming the risk of someone else's negligence. And that's what this case is about. This is about a crash arguing about negligence. And that crash is you can't assume the risk that somebody else will be negligent, right? You might contribute to it, to it and that's where the contributory negligence comes in. You might contribute to it, but you don't um you don't assume that someone else is going to be so negligent that it's going to cause a problem. Similar kind of to driving. You you assume the risk of driving, but that others are also going to adhere to the rules of the road, which is why we saw a ton of um a ton of, you know, car collision lawsuits over monetary. So case skills, can we not call him Schwartzy? That's my dad's friend and it's confusing. Schwartzy is kind of funny because he does look a little like Schwartzy. Jennifer says, what does that have to do with anything? So this was coming, this question came in right at the end. I should have swooped to questions. I didn't, I just started talking. That question was regarding the relationship with the daughter. They are going to get into the plaintiff's relationships because this expert that's testifying said the best way to tell about this brain injury is knowing how, what his normal was before. What was his like before his activity level, his engagement with people, his behavior, what was he like before the ski collision? And what was he like after it's, they're arguing that the brain injury from the concussion 
from the ski injury changed the course of his life. And if you are listening to this witness and going, yes, he used to be able to travel and ski and lived a vibrant life, and now he doesn't, what is that worth monetarily damages wise? What Gwyneth Paltrow's attorneys in the defense are going to ask is, well, did it though? Because let's look at the other aspect of his life that might not be so, so pretty. Let's look at the daughter that he had a difficult relationship with. Did his relationships really change? Did his personality really change? Did this injury change his life? Or are you maybe painting a skewed picture? And I never like it when the expert doesn't get all the information. I think it looks skewed when the expert's like, I only got the two depositions. Why not give the expert all of the depositions and let them parse through? Yes, I saw that, but I found this more compelling than that. Let the expert do it. Don't leave it for cross-examination. That is the way things are done. It's just not the way I thought I it's not the way I prefer it to be done. I think experts that are good experts can say this is this is why I believe this more than that. Let the experts stand on their opinion. Let them consider everything. And if the opinion is the same, the opinion is the same. So it just, it you know, just because he has a difficult relationship with one daughter doesn't necessarily mean that he didn't have the changes in personality that people saw or the, the impact to his life from the injury. Let the expert decide. So that's why it all matters. And we're going to get a lot of that this afternoon on cross-examination. I like this attorney for Paltrow, the, uh, the attorney that always seems to be, um, Oh, but your honor, I don't want to get any objections. You are the lawyer. People are going to object. Have you not trialed before? That attorney, um, I find a bit more challenging. <laughs> I find a bit more challenging. I'm going to do a few more questions and then I am going to get, uh, then I am going to get some food and get to my interviews. What time do I, I need to look at my, my calendar real quick. What time is my next it's just a busy, it's a busy day, y'all. I didn't expect to be covering trial because the first time I pulled the law nerds, they were like, eh, we're kind of good. And then we all got invested and now we're here. So with that, um, there was some mention of ski patrol called off. Do you remember hearing that? From the opening and from the testimony yesterday, it seems when ski patrol was called was an interesting timing to me. It seems that the plaintiff Sanderson got up, started skiing down the mountain, and then his friend noticed that he was having difficult difficulty skiing. And then Ski Patrol was called and he was taken down the hill. Instead of, if he was unconscious and face down in the snow, one would think they would have called Ski Patrol then if he was unconscious for five minutes face down in the snow. So how long he was in the snow is is interesting to me because you would think the ski instructors would call, but that's what they're arguing that the ski instructors should have and didn't. Lori asked, isn't this character assassination? Is that fair? His character, it's first, it's not truly character because part of him and his behavior changing is part of his damages assessment. So it's not just saying he has bad character, so you shouldn't give him any money. It's saying for Paltrow's side, their argument is, look, the plaintiff is saying he was here and now he's here and that's where the damages comes in. We're saying he wasn't here, that he was always here. And so there's no damages. So no, it's part of the trial process. It is not pleasant. Trial will get into everything, but it's going to come up for her too. He put his mental condition at issue because he is asking for damages based on the, the head injury and others. So this plaintiff put these things at issue by choosing to sue. And that is, and that is part of the choice that people make. And it's part of the choice people make when they choose not to sue. So warning said, how bad is it? Her walking out like that? The jury was already gone. So it's not bad in front of the jury. I don't like seeing it. Yesterday, the attorneys asked, can Ms. Paltrow leave? We know the attorneys are very upset with her having media around her going to the car. There's lots of videos online of her going in and out of the courthouse yesterday. It seems to be something she is quite sensitive about, and her counsel is quite 
focused on. So it might be just to try to get the ingress egress down. I would have thought that the attorneys would have talked about this more with the court after watching what happened in Debbie Heard with the ingress egress. But I think the attorneys just don't pay attention to the other big trials. Truly, they should. They should. Um, well, the guy got permission to not be there, so couldn't Gwyneth Paltrow get permission to leave early? Yes. They had asked yesterday. Today, they didn't seem to bring it to the court's attention, and the court went, oh, okay. So they should bring it to the court's attention each time. Um, is it any worse that Gwyneth walked out or than Poot leaving? Poot leaving was odd, too, but that was a much more casual court than this one. This court is a bit more formal. So they still need permission from the court and should have permission from the court to do it. So, um, cloudy girl, I've definitely seen that. I think Gwyneth Paltrow, look, we we are exposed to Gwyneth Paltrow in her life more than this plaintiff. We don't know anything about this plaintiff, and I think that's a detriment to Paltrow as the plaintiff, or sorry, as the defendant in this case. It's something that Paltrow is going to have to overcome with her behavior. But what happened in this collision is still really up in the air to me. I don't have a clear sense of these facts or these stories. I am not going to make a decision about what I think w about this until we get to the end. I'm sure from Paltrow's perspective, she thinks that she is spending, you know, weeks sitting in a courtroom and possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars defending this case that wasn't her fault. And Sanderson is like, who the fuck do you think you are, Hollywood actress, to run into me on a ski slope? These these parties are at at just at odds. I don't know how they come together on that. And that's why we're in trial. Obviously they couldn't come together and settle it. And both sides think that they're right. And that's why we don't have a settlement because they have stuck their flags in the ground and said, no, that's it. Um, and as to his age, I mean, my mother is, I'm not mom. I love you. You never watch to the end of my live streams. I'm not going to blast my mother's age on the internet, but my mother is in her seventies and still skis. Um, and, and still loves it. But if somebody ran into her on a ski slope, she could be very seriously injured. So it's something I think about with her too. I'm not surprised at 69 years old, he was still skiing. He should be able to do so within his ability range. He wasn't a new skier without a collision. They're going to argue that he was looking away and he's blind in one eye and that's why he didn't see her. So, you know, I don't know. His age is going to come into play, not that he shouldn't have been skiing, but whether that is the cause of some of the um, the things that he is seeing in his life, some of the damages. Remember, with civil, damages is, you know, you were here and now you're here, and how do you monetarily compensate for the damage that was done? Civil feels kind of gross in that way. How do you put a monetary value on quality of life? But that's really what civil is about. What is your loss of quality of life because of this thing? And how do we how do we put a dollar figure on that? And then how do we explain to a jury that what I would have liked to have seen is to see the story from the plaintiff first and then see from the doctors. And that just might not have worked out scheduling wise. So it might just not have. Um, it, trust me, if my mom thought I was telling her age on the Internet, she would call and yell at me. <laughs> She would absolutely tell me what she thought. Hi, George, we're back. We're just, the cats are just, the cats are everywhere today. You aren't often on screen, friend. Hi. Fred has more, Fred has more white. So you'll see Fred back in the chair. George, not as white. Um, He is all ginger. All ginger. All right. With that, y'all, it is, we have been live for almost three and a half hours. I will keep an eye on this afternoon it seems like it is going to be mostly um, doctor testimony for the rest of the day. If I can zoom, zoom and summarize that for you tomorrow when I start streaming, I will. I will be back here when court starts in the morning. I don't know what time that will be yet till the end of the day, but I'll be back here before that uh, my normal 11 a.m. start time. Make sure you're at Law Nerd Alert because if I decide to go live, if something crazy happens, a doctor gets stuck in the snow and they call Gwyneth Paltrow, I will go live. You better believe it. We will be live here. Otherwise, like if you see me on Up and Adam going, I gotta go. <laughs> I will be over there at 3.15 this afternoon talking about all of the things. All right. It's time to go get some lunch, y'all. I hope you have, you've had a good day. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being Law Nerds. And with that, I will see you, well, maybe this afternoon, but definitely tomorrow morning. Bye.
You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the Quick Bits. <laughs>